Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Sincerity or Hypocrisy. And it is part of Love in Action series. It was presented in London, UK on the 17th of July, 2012. systems yeah um, I find it very interesting and probably appropriate actually that we're such a small group and one of the reasons why we are such a small group is the last time we were here um, I challenged a lot of the relationships that people were having with spirits remember and uh, and most of those people obviously they became very angry and upset with the information I gave them of course and uh, and so most of those people haven't wanted to return and that's pretty normal for people who have a heavy um, interaction with spirits with regard to their addictions. So, um, so this group, most of you are not so overclaked with spirits, which is very good. And, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> and so we have a chance to talk about uh, some things that are fairly important. One, uh, what I would like to talk about today with you is... Um, is about God's love in action. So if I just write that down. So love in action is a part of a series that I've been starting to talk to people about. And this particular um, discussion I'd like us to centre around the issues of sincerity um, or hypocrisy. which are very, two very different states, one of sincerity and one of hypocrisy. And the main reason why I wanted to talk about this with you is because what, what I'm finding, particularly in the Western world, is that there is often an appearance of outward sincerity, but when you start discussing detailed information with people individually, they go from outward sincerity into, into hypocrisy quite rapidly. And for, for you to progress towards God, you must at some point come to terms with the fact that God doesn't accept hypocrisy. Now in the first century, I used to say to people things like, woe to the scribes and ph Pharisees, hypocrites, because they strained out the gnat and gulped down the camel. Have you ever heard of that saying? Ever heard of that? Some of you who are religious might have heard that saying. And what I meant by that was they, they, they made big mountains out of tiny little things, mountains out of molehills, as the saying goes, and at the same time, they allowed the really big issues to go completely unnoticed. Does that make sense? And if you look at love in action, and we look at the word spirituality... So if I just write that word. What does spirituality mean to you? Now, if I had, when I asked that question the last time we were here at Forest Row, um, spirituality meant a lot of things for people, but not many people actually talked about love with regard to what it meant to them. So to me, true spirituality is all about love. It's all about the development of the individual in love. And it's all about growing in the capacity to love. Now, there are two forms of love, as we've talked about before. One is God's love entering you. And obviously, if you grow in your capacity to receive God's love, then your soul has the ability to change and transform. And once you've changed and transformed, you now have grown in your capacity to express your love to others automatically. So it's all about, true spirituality is all about growing in love. And unless love is growing, then really it means nothing. Can you see that? Like really, we are not being spiritual at all unless love is growing. That's the underlying thing to keep in mind. What I notice people doing though, is they have this facade of love where where they use the words of love, but when you feel what they're feeling or what they're expressing towards you in terms of their feelings, 
often it just feels like quite nasty and terrible emotions coming out of it. Now, if you think historically, in terms of many religions do this, so while they use the words of love, they then express at the same time judgment towards people who are not of their religious faith, for example. Does that make sense? Now, in that moment, they are being unloving. And therefore, it doesn't matter what words they're using. The fact is that they are being completely unloving in that particular space. Now, and this brings me to the point of what is real spirituality. Well, real spirituality is about growth in love, actually growing in your ability to express love to others and also in your ability to love yourself and your ability to love the environment. So it means growing in the ability in all of these different areas. So let's look at the areas where you would be growing in your ability to love if you were truly spiritual. Well, firstly, the love that you have with God would increase. So that would go up as you grew in your capacity to love. Your capacity to love yourself would increase. So you have now a stronger, not only desire, but a stronger um, acknowledgement of yourself as, and your desires and your passions and your true, sincere motivations. And your ability to love your partner would increase. In other words, you would have less arguments and fights, but not because of... Um, agreeing with each other, but rather because you now know how to handle these agreements within, from a space of love, the disagreements from a space of love. You would have more love for your children if you had any. So there would be less instant anger or rage with your children. Like, you know, a lot of times young children can do seemingly uh, very unpredictable things that we often wonder what, where that came from. And oftentimes in that moment we get triggered into rage and anger. That would happen less as time progressed if we were growing in love. We would have also more love for others in the way that we express our love. So we, we would care about other people's feelings and we would care about their life and we'd care about what they're doing with their life and we'd want to assist any person not from a condition of judgment but rather from a condition of anybody who wants some help would be willing to provide the help even at times if that providing that help meant that we had to forgo something we wanted we would still probably do that and then there's the environment generally which we would also grow in love for because we understand that that's all part of God's creation and so we would automatically start loving the environment more as well if we were truly growing in love. Now when we look at that list, you can see there's quite a lot of growth in different areas of love that we, we, we potentially can grow in. Now if our love was truly in action, we would other people around us would notice changes in every one of these areas of our life. Does that make sense? So they'd notice that we're treating the environment differently. They'd notice that we're treating them differently. They'd notice that we treat our children differently. They'd notice that we're treating our partner differently. They'd notice that we have a bit more honouring of ourself in most of our relationships and so forth. And they'd also notice a growing uh, interaction with God where, where you started to feel very comfortable with that interaction with God and, and its growth. Now what I notice a lot of people doing who discover the divine love path or discover divine truth is they want to believe that they're growing in every one of these areas because we all want to believe that when we do something that it's actually working. Right? But when you look at what's really going on from a day-to-day -day perspective in their life, there is actually very little growth. And I've known many people who have come along to seminars that I've been presenting, for example, in Australia, for four years, and during that four-year period, I've not seen them grow in love at all over that entire time. But they say they want to grow in love, and they're obviously coming to the seminars for some reason, 
there's obviously some underlying reason why they're coming and they're saying that they want to be more loving of their partner and they want to receive God's love and so forth and so forth but their day-to-day -day life is not demonstrating more love now we also have others that we know that we meet them and then after a few months they're making huge changes in their lives, like one after another after another, and, it's, and everyone around them is noticing that they're becoming more loving and more expressive of that love towards them. And the environment is noticing it, their own environment, and you know their children sometimes comment. Like I had one child come up and say, I'm so glad my mummy met you because she's not angry with me anymore. Like, so he, even her, the, his, her own child noticed a big change in... The, the mother just by by coming to terms with the truth and this is what I wanted to raise with with you because what I find here in England generally is that there is a huge amount of facade with regard to spirituality in other words there are so many people here who like to have the new age instant gratification of some kind of pursuit which often then in, encourages a lot of very dark spirits to enter into bartering or bribery type situations with the person, rather than actually making changes in the way they personally love in these areas. Right? And if you think of the last uh, groups we had, for those of you who attended the groups in Forest Row, can you remember some of the very, very unloving behaviour that went on in the different groups from people who believed they were loving? Right? And this is a, the issue that we face, is that we need to, at some point, come to terms with what we're actually doing personally. So we need to ask ourselves the question, am I sincere about growing in love, or am I just being a hypocrite? Do I, do I want to talk about it and I, do I want to think about it but not actually not change my life about it? So I wanted to raise this with you and just get your comments about it a bit as well. Like, so let's uh, look at uh, the three things that we often do with regard to love. We, we think about it. And thinking about it means that during the course of the day, occasionally things come up and then you think about, oh, that... You know, you might be thinking about a person or a different situation that happens right in front of you. And you, that, you, know, you might see a, a mother yelling at her child or something like that. And, and this brings up some uh, feelings inside of you. And then you go into this feeling of, oh, um, I can see that that person there seems to be being unloving to that child. And so there's a thought of love and then often along with the thought we often have a little bit of uh, judgment don't we sometimes uh, where we go oh, this kind of feeling we have welcome this kind of feeling we have is uh, a feeling of judgment like oh, I'm glad I'm not like that <laughs> with my child or something like that so we often have thoughts about love we also have thoughts about, in the, including during the day, about how we can become more loving, generally. Most people at some point during the day will consider that thought. We also speak a lot of words. Too many sometimes, don't we? Where we talk about love. So, we, so we, where we talk about the principles of love, or we talk about the principles of truth, or we talk about um, what, what we believe we're interested in. But to me, those particular things mean nothing, actually. Because there's only going to be one evidence or proof of evidence that we are actually growing in love. And do you know what that is? Actions. Actions. Without actions... What's going to happen? We, we, we end up talking and thinking things, but without actions proving that change is occurring, change isn't really occurring, is it? We're just staying the same, staying the same, staying the same, staying the same. And then we've got to ask ourselves, if, if actions are not happening 
then which one of these two are we really in with regard to our desire to grow in love? Can you see what I'm saying? Like, which one is it? It's obviously we're being hypocritical. So, so we, we're talking about love, saying we're thinking about love, spending all of our time investigating so-called truth or divine truth even you might be investigating. But at the end of the day, if, if actions are not changing, and by the way, if the actions are not changing automatically, see if I was growing in love, then my actions would become more loving automatically. Can that, does that make sense? I, I, I wouldn't be having this strong feeling of uh, um, I have to try and try and try to become more loving each day because as you release the unhealed emotions that cause you to be unloving, what would happen? Automatically, you'd become more loving as you, and you wouldn't have to try so hard. So if I'm having to try hard to... to you know, speak lovingly and in particular act lovingly, then can you see that it probably means that I'm not being as sincere as I would like. Now, do any of you know where the word hypocrisy comes from? Any ideas? And if we can have the mics uh, for, for the... Has anyone got any idea where it comes from? No? It was used originally for the Greek stage actors. And initially all of them were men. So there were no women stage actors. And even here in England that happened, for, as many of you probably know, right the way through up until, what was it, the 17th or 18th century, there were no women actors. They were all men dressed up as women, yes? And so they, the underlying Greek term means to, to act or put on a facade. A facade on purpose is the original intention. But, uh, and if you think about it, during our day-to-day -day life, many of us do that, don't we? put on a facade on purpose. So how many times do you wake up in the morning and you're feeling quite unsettled or you know, feeling quite bad, but you realise you've got a big day ahead of you, right? so you decide to, if you're a woman, maybe put on some makeup, um, have a coffee or, a, or your favourite tea perhaps. How many of you drink coffee? How many of you drink tea? Any ideas? Coffee? Who's coffees? Who's teas? Yeah, okay, more teas than coffees, which is what you probably expect for Britain. Um, and then, uh, so that warms you up, gets you out of a bit of your fear, and then you're sort of getting yourself ready for the day, and, and you're actually, oftentimes we're actually changing who we are in order to meet the rest of the day, and changing what we feel in order to reach the rest of the day. So really what we're doing is we're doing what the Beatles said. You, we're, we're keeping our face in a jar by the door, you know, the Eleanor Rigby song, keeping our face in a jar by the door that we put on when we go outside. And then uh, when we come back inside, take off the face. And for many of us, we're so used to the face that we don't take it off. <laughs> right? We actually start this face with our family and even our friends uh, also get a bit of this facade as well. And that's what it means to be a hypocrite, to act one way, to act differently than you actually feel. Right. Now, can you see the problem with that? Acting differently to how you feel from God's perspective? If, if God wants a relationship with the real you and you're wanting to act differently to the, the real you, then who can God have a relationship? Not having a relationship, he's, he's still having a relationship with the real you, but it's not going to be a very good relationship because you're in complete denial of the real you, wanting to be somebody else. And this is the issue we face with regard to sincerity. There's also the issue with regard to sincerity that I feel is very important, and that is this, this idea that we need to stop uh, believing that we can act lovingly without feeling love. And, that, and to be honest, 
from, our, from God's perspective, from our Father's perspective, that's not possible either. To act lovingly while you're not feeling it. Because God sees every facade. God sees everything as it is. And we also need to become very, very comfortable with seeing everything as it is. Can you see? We, we need to become comfortable with ourselves being our true self. And so what I see happening for many here in Europe in particular is that many, because of these issues, are, are happy to embrace a certain amount of divine truth, but they're not, happy to, they're not changing their lives. So they're happy to listen, but their actual lives are not changing. And can I point out the main reason why this is the case? You see, when we uh, first hear truth... It's external to us. It's emotionally external. In other words, when we first hear the divine truth, you know, the truth about the universe, we, we feel this really big feeling of, at last, like I'm finding out things that I've always searched for all my life, always wanted to discover all of my life. And there's this beautiful feeling in that of like at last having this feeling of this longing for truth inside of you being satisfied, of knowing how things around you work and understanding your place in those things as they operate. And that is what I would classify as external truth. Now, external truth is always very easy to absorb. It's always very easy to, to enjoy listening to. So if I spoke about the spirit world to you as a group, many of you would find the discussion very enjoyable. Right? Because there's all sorts of things about spirit spirit world that you might not know or understand. And if we started even talking to some spirits who, uh, right here in front of you, you might find the whole thing very absorbing. And... Uh, and many people do, of course, find exactly that's the case. And the reason why we find it so absorbing is because there are very few emotional challenges to receive external truth. Can you see that? In the sense that we don't have any blockages or many blockages to receiving external truth often, particularly when we have a, a heart that's seeking the truth. We have very little blockages as a result. And so what happens is the external truth is very, very attractive to us. We want to listen to it. You know, and many of you, when you, th when you first discovered um, the teachings that myself and Mary are sharing with you, many of you, if you, can you remember back to when you first discovered it? Like, it was like listening to it every day. Wow, this is amazing, this is amazing. Oh, that's amazing too. And you have all of these realizations and it's just so absorbing, isn't it? Like there's this initial enthusiasm that comes over you when that w during that first process it's sort of like sort of like falling in love type of feeling almost with the truth does that make sense that's often what we're feeling and that feeling is easy because there's not a lot of our personal emotional um, what i would classify as our addictions being satisf satisfied or triggered or in other words confronted so most of what we're receiving doesn't personally confront us at a hugely emotional level with external truth. Now, some of it may, if we had a background of a certain religion and then some truth was talked to about that particular religion, that might be confronting. But generally, um, when we're pretty open, a lot, we can absorb a lot of external truth without being confronted too much. And it's really fun during that time, yes? But then... What happens is we realise this, that love is the actual thing that we need to start looking at because we realise that that is true spirituality. So after a while we get to the point where we've absorbed enough external truth to realise that we could pretty much give up all things in our life aside from developing in love and we'd be very happy. And we start realising that love is the key to our happiness, in fact. That without love, either personal love with another person, love with God, love with our neighbour, love with the environment, without love, 
it's not going to be possible to be happy. And we start to realize that. Right? So we start to realize that we, us the individual who's been receiving all of this external truth, has to at some point embrace love. We have to, if we're ever going to be happy, we need to go down that track. And we start realizing that. And then we start realizing that to actually love, we've got to do a few things first. For example, we've got to learn the internal truth about ourselves. And we actually have to be humble enough to do that, to look at ourselves honestly. And this is where it gets very, very difficult. This is where we start getting bogged down with our life, where we start getting wanting to give up. And, and if you think about that initial feeling you had when you discovered the external truth and how joyous you felt and how great it was to discover that external truth, and then compare that with how it feels when you're starting to have to discover the internal truth, can you see the difference between the two? For many of you, you've already gone through this or going through this experience where you, where you don't like what you see about yourself. You'd like to deny that you actually have that particular thing inside of you. You'd like to shut that down completely and not be humble to it at all. And, and so here we had a very enjoyable process of discovering truth. But here what do we have? a very confronting and oftentimes not very enjoyable process because we have so much resistance to it. Can you see that? But it's this that will actually change how we love. So at some point we're going to have to come face to face with, without changing this we are never going to actually become more loving. And therefore, we're never going to become more spiritual. Because spirituality is all about love. So the truth can open the doorway to love, but we have to actually walk through it. We have to actually put love in action to actually make changes. And this is where most of us become very resistive because there are so many things we have to change but we're very unwilling to change. And what I'd like to go through with you is just if you, if you could help me look at the things that are here in England that surround you that you can see have to change if we're going to become more loving just in terms of the external environment. So what I'd like to do now is take you through a process where you look at the external environment and we list the things that have to change to become more loving and then we'll have to have a bit of a self-reflection at the end of that. Does that sound all right? If we can begin that process. So, from your analysis of... You, you've, most of you have lived here how long? Most of your life? Okay. So you should be pretty well experienced with what happens here in England. Yes, so um, you should be able to help me fairly easily with, uh, with what you observe in the environment that has to change if your environment is going to become more loving. So please help me out. Yep, yep. Uh, food production. If we just, uh, I'll just make sure I've got them turned on properly. Can you put the mic right up to your mouth? Like that? That's it. So I was saying food production. Um, so and food production has to change. Its effect on the environment. Uh, okay, so in terms of uh, how it's produced, is that what you're saying? Yep, so how food is produced, yep, good. Anything else? Uh, what food we actually eat. So, so for, for me, I'm kind of like... So uh, food, yeah. food consumption? Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, the two are very related. You know, they're not going to produce food that nobody eats. <laughs> so, yep, very related. Anything else you can think of? Yeah, and you put it right. I was just up. thinking that the uh, 
something about in the English that we're quite suppressed, I think, and I think that's why we have a lot of alcohol issues, why people feel the need to get... So we get very, very drunk, at the, not me personally, but yep. we have a real drinking culture here, and I think it's a lot of it's suppression. So. so could we say... We, we could we lump it all together and look at the issues of ab ab abusive substances? Yes. Should we just call it yeah. that? Substance abuse? Yeah. There's a lot more than that. You're all feeling a bit blank at the moment, are you? Like, <laughs> under pressure. So you get a bit blank. Yep. If we go back one. Um, the education, uh, the way we educate. Uh, the way we educate our children? children? Yeah. Or everyone in the... Well, that's the same for the whole world. I Good. Think. Yep. So it is the same for the whole world, yes. And also, is, is this sort of question as well. Yeah. Um, when we vaccinate our children, is that... Okay? Is that loving? Yeah. Good question. So let's raise the issues of how the medical system works as a medical profession. So things have to change there yeah. in that environment. Yes, I agree. Um, anything else you can think of? Um, we have a lot of... Um, I don't know how to put this. Hierarchy. You know, okay, the so the there's a... A lack of equality yes. is probably the best yeah. way of doing it. So we, we, we have, um, let's put it down as a lack of equality, shall we? So, so we're being a bit more specific. Yep. So you have a lot of haves, a few haves and a lot of have-nots and so forth. But also there is this in England, isn't there, that is very unique, which even some of the have-nots still think themselves superior <laughs> than some of the haves because of their history, you know, their lineage, which is a very interesting thing in a lot of other countries that doesn't happen so much, particularly in Australia. That, uh, um, that would never happen in Australia, so, yeah. Uh, the monetary system. Okay, um, can we think of what's unloving about the monetary system? Um, money itself. Ma yeah, I can't agree that money is unloving. Money is a piece of paper, so and piece of papers don't have love. Either way. The, the way the banks are run. So you put it a bit closer. Oh, so, sorry. Yeah. The way the banks are run. The way the banks are run. Okay. Well, the way the banks are run are just a reflection of the way society runs in a lot of ways. So I notice in your uh, environment at the moment, there's a lot of blame going to the banks. But many of you personally have benefited from the bank's shonky deals. So, you know, like, so at the end of the day, you've got to start looking at that. But yes, monetary system is a, a big area of, yeah, love. I agree. The area with money is about interest. It's about how much interest you charge. Instead of money being free, yeah? Yeah. So therefore, when you lend money, you give money, it comes back on an equal basis when you actually then charge an interest. Right. That so is when you get greed or avarice or ownership of money. Yeah, I don't agree that that's the cause of greed or avarice or ownership of money, but, uh, but I think it is an issue, certainly, the interest. The causes are very different than what we often believe, though. But, uh, but again, can I point out that nothing is for free Everything, like all the resources on the planet, have a cost associated with them, even an environmental cost if there is no other cost. So could we say, if we were more specific about the problem, could we say that the problem really is that we don't understand how to economically use resources? Isn't that the, the big problem? We, we overuse some resources, underuse other resources, we have a terrible viewpoint towards the earth about the provision of resources. We rape the earth, basically, don't we, for the use of its resources. And, and this environment rapes everything it can get. This, this current generation rapes everything it can get. And then, of course, there's a lot less left for the next generation. And then they come along and rape what's left, of the, uh, the other ones left behind. And then, of course... Uh, there's even less for the subsequent generation and so forth and so forth. And you get this environment in the end, like I was just commenting to Mike on the way here, how it's lovely to see some big trees in this area because in most of Britain you've got big cleared lands where there's no trees 
Um, and that obviously has happened over centuries and over thousands of years where people have taken down, taken down, not, never regrown and so forth. So it's about our use of resources and raping resources. Okay. Anything else you can think of? I came from Brazil and um, your next stop. I yeah, yeah. And uh, in Brazil, when, when I was a kid, whenever television broke down, we went and fixed it. Yeah. Or whenever we had a radio, then it broke down, we went and fixed it. When I came to Britain, it was quite shocking that people just chucked the stuff in the bin. Throw it away. Yeah. And uh, as I felt as years progressed of my live, me living here, I've been here since 2000, yeah. um, people st- I noticed the same behavior towards people. Yes. So if, if, uh, if I was in a relationship and the guy just didn't like, or there wasn't working out, not, not so much as in working out of things that are already not working out, but the behavior towards materi- material things would be transferred to people. I agree completely. And it's a very important point you raise because it's interesting that all of these things you've so far raised are really even less important than some of the other issues that we've yet to raise. So one of them is how we throw people away is a major problem, isn't it? So we, um, can we say, I'll just wait for (laughs) Jess to turn off that. (laughs) Thanks, Jess. Uh, if any of our others, if you have one going, please, please turn it off. Um, so, so we would say, what would we say here? It's the way we treat people is a problem, isn't it, in the society? Yeah. So, so unloving treatment of people. Can I, can I suggest for a start that many of these things below that line that I've just drawn there, while they are important, they are actually just the effects of other problems that we need to start addressing above this line. All right. they, and in fact, many of us, if you look at uh, what we do with these effects, is we get angry about them. Have you noticed that sometimes? You get angry about certain things. How many of you have been angry with your banks in the last two weeks? Or felt a feeling of that? Like I know in Britain it's been a fairly big thing in the papers and so forth. But we often get angry about things, these kind of things. But, but we're unwilling to look at why they happen. And this is a part of our hypocrisy. You see, if we were sincere we would know why these things happen. Can you see? We, w- we would start seeing things like this. That so- things like this are far more an indication that we're developed with our sincerity. These kind of things are about, we often are blaming systems. Have you noticed? If you look at each one of these things that you've raised, the majority of them are, are systems, aren't they? Now, systems all have people in them, But the reality is, while I can blame a system, I can say that I am not a part of that system. I can can disassociate myself from the system while I'm blaming the system. But the reality is, all of you live in Britain. You are a part of the system if you live here. Yes? Can you see that? So... So we can criticise the system, but the reality is there's something inside of us that allows its creation. And if we were sincere, we'd already know what's inside of us that allowed its creation. Um, well, unloving treatment of self, then. That, that's, yeah, that's a massive one. Yes. Because um, that leads to so many of those things. <laughs> it does, Yeah. Very the much animals so. and everything else. Yes, yeah, so let's put in there animals or everything in the environment. Because we're, we're prepared to um, <coughs> unlovingly treat everything in the environment. That, and we can just add to that list, can't we? Now, of course, if we're prepared to unlovingly do that, then these things will result. And then you know what we finish up doing as a society generally? We complain about these things. And yet none of us finish up complaining about these things in the sense of looking at ourselves and going, what inside of me 
Every single day happens where I treat somebody unlovingly or I treat an animal unlovingly or I treat the environment unlovingly and make an effort to reduce those particular things inside of ourselves emotionally. Yeah. Mary, um, you can, yeah, 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 if we can pass one around to Mary and then... Yeah. Oh, the, oh, sorry, I'm missing you, am I? Fire away, Jess. Let's go over there first and then we'll come over here. Um, I was going to say that a lot of these, I think, to do with responsibility. And once we really feel with love responsibility, then some of these will naturally shift, like education and med med uh, medical stuff, substance abuse, yes, food con consumption and production. All of that's to do with responsibility and a connection with love and self-love and love with others. I agree. So, so the fact is we're looking at things where mankind isn't really taking responsibility. We create a system that we don't even think we're responsible for creating. Yeah, and we can externalise it and then blame it. And then we can externalise it, exactly, as you say, and blame it. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly right. Yep. Yeah, I've gone a bit blank now. Oh, sorry, um, Emily. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the same with politics, you know, we love to blame politicians for everything, but, you know, we've been the society that have brought them in or let it happen. Yes. Um, yeah. But what I wanted to say was something else. Um, it was to do with sort of the responsibility and then television was kind of the main thing about avoiding things and just gluing yourself to a box and just letting the hours go. Yes, I see a big problem here in, in all Western societies actually is how much time we spend tuning out of real life. Can you see, like if you, if you look at how much time in the course of a week the average child spends tuning out of real life, it, they did a study I think recently here and the average child spends five hours either in front of a, a, a video game of some kind or in front of the telly during the course of a, a single day. So that, that's a lot of tuning out of real life. Now, if I'm tuning out of real life, I'm going to be tuned out of a lot of things as well, aren't I? Yep, I agree. Yeah, I, I, I can't watch TV. I find it really frustrating. I, I've never really been able to, for more than an hour or something, yeah. I just get irritable. Yeah. But I just, you know, I've talked to friends and they just, they just do it as an escape a lot of them. And it's just, yes. You know, yep. The willingness to use addictions as an escape. Yeah. Yeah, big issue, yeah. So Mary and then across. Uh, mine is to do with resistance to change. Yes. Um, so personally and in the society. And I notice here in Britain there's a lot of bureaucracy which reflects that injury. Yes. So there's a lot of, um, yeah, bureaucracy. So right. And change. whenever a change is uh, proposed, then there's a huge system that ha everyone has to work through. And also a lot of social pressure for people to to conform to norms of behaviour, of dress, of all kinds of things. Yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I was going to talk about responsibility as well. Yes. Um, well, I don't have television at home. Yep. I haven't had one for years, but yep. I'm still either blaming others, uh, I mean, being a victim, Yes. Keenly. <laughs> yes, a keen victim, yes. yes. I, I like that statement. It's a good statement. Many of us are keen victims. <laughs> yeah. Or just saying to myself, everybody does that. Exactly. Uh, so justifying my own actions by everybody else's actions. Yes, so everybody does a, the wrong thing, so I might as well go ahead and do the wrong thing too. And we often then go down the track of going, well, one person changing it is not going to change anything. So, so we, we actually believe that so, so we know we're doing the wrong thing, but we're going to ourselves, well, everybody does it, and if I change, that's not going to change everybody, and so then we stay doing it along with them as a justification. Yep. And it's always been that way. Yes, it's always been that way, so it will always be that way, is the inference, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I feel in England there's um, a loss of belief in God um, and nobody, you know, if you tell people you really believe in God, they actually think you're crazy yeah. and um, have, yeah, I think that's a quite so, a big problem. So could we say the problem really is, if I just put, uh, use this area, I might just rub one of these out so I've got a bit more space to work with. Could we say that the problem really is a fear of people's opinions?
Yeah. Can you see how that plays out in your life a lot? When you know, when you know you want to do the right thing, but but people, other people's opinions, cause you to go and do something that you actually regret later, or you're even regretting while you're doing it. In many times, um, yep, the fear of people's opinion, and in fact. Fear generally is a very, very large emotion that causes a lot of unloving behaviour. Right? That's the reality. Fear, fear does a lot of that. Okay. Is there anything else you, you come with, Amanda? I think this has sort of already been said, but a real unwillingness to feel our pain, our negative emotions. We just want to escape from them. So could we call that to a fear of painful emotions? Or just no. pain generally. We don't like suffering. We do anything to avoid the suffering. Yeah, but the irony is we say that, that we don't like suffering, but the majority of us finish up constructing a life where we suffer, and so that would tend to indicate that the reality is that we do like suffering. <laughs> because if we didn't like suffering, we'd stop creating lives that, where we cause suffering. And this is where I feel a lot of people are not being completely sincere. You see... Um, I feel a lot of times what we do and when we learn the truth, we start telling ourselves things that are not even true for ourselves. In other words, we tell ourselves, I don't like suffering. But how much suffering do you have in your life? Quite a lot for the average person. So that tells me they do like suffering. Otherwise, they'd change the, reason why, the reasons for their suffering and, and do that. But because they're so afraid of other things and a lot of times afraid of people in their environment, they don't change. And so what we finish up doing is creating a lot of our own pain. Uh, that's the reality. We finish up creating a lot of our personal pain because we're unwilling to address the fear we have. And then we say we don't like suffering, but, but the reality is we must like suffering to a degree in the sense that we must like suffering more than we like people's bad opinion. So in other words, we have a priority system inside of us as what we like. So you think about it. If you, if you just dressed up in uh, one week old clothes and you went out just for a way down the street or something, or let's say you dressed up in your dressing gown and you went out down the street, dropped off the children and then, and then your, um, the tyre in your car broke, you know, had a puncture. Um, what, what would most of you feel pretty uncomfortable with now? Actually getting out and fixing it would be a bit embarrassing, wouldn't it? Why do we find those situations embarrassing? Because we're actually afraid of other people's opinion. We're more afraid of other people's opinion in many cases than we are afraid of anything else. That's reality for many of us. So, so oftentimes we accept pain so that there's a higher thing that we can get satisfied. So in other words, for example, I accept pain when other people's opinion might tell me to do something d different than I w really want to do. So instead of doing what I really want to do, I do what they want me to do and accept the pain that goes along with doing that. And I automatically do that because other people's opinion is more important to me than my own pain. Yeah, Amanda, you? yeah it's slightly underneath the unloving, I suppose. But I think I feel as though we're quite arrogant as a nation because we had an empire once. We think we've got things that we can teach the world rather than the other way around. Yes, you actually still believe you have an empire. Um, actually, many of people in Britain, <laughs> I find. And uh, if we look at this, this is a very important emotion to address as a society in Britain, this empire emotion. The reason why it's a very important emotion to address is, you, you think about it, what causes a nation to believe that it can go to other nations and rape the other nations and pillage the other nations and actually take over the land and everything and actually, in the end, destroy many of the peoples in those other nations in order to satisfy its own lust for whatever it is that they're getting in return. What emotion causes that? There's got to be an emotion, doesn't there, of some kind that causes that. And so there, there has to be an emotion, a very a large emotion of arrogance in there. Yeah, 
that causes that kind of attitude. Um, I was just thinking about the, the pain thing. I have, I, I don't know whether I'm right about this, but um, in the sort of spiritual world, that, um, I see a lot of people thinking that they have to crucify themselves in the name of doing something spiritual. I know that the processing that we do can be uncomfortable and painful, but I, I observe um, a bit, sometimes a bit, it's almost adding drama to it. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I agree totally. I, I see people swinging between two extremes. Yeah. One extreme is they feel they have to be totally self-flagellating <laughs> and, and in pain constantly to be holy and, uh, you know, and, and um, approved of by God. And on the other extreme, I see people in the New Age movement thinking they have to re have pleasure every single moment, and if they're not in pleasure, they're not spiritual every single moment. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I see this great big uh, wide variety between those two s extreme states. But it appears that religions in Britain either promote that state or that state, and nothing seemingly fairly reasonable in the middle, where where we're going to have to work our way through emotions in order to become happy. And, and so on this side, you know, the new age type of state, I see people desperately wanting to be overcloaked by spirits and have happy emotions all the time. And that's why when we were at Forest Row, the majority of people who came were overcloaked because they want to be happy all the time. They, they, and they give up their entire life in order to be happy all the time. And then you, you have other audiences which are more religious in nature generally and they have a very um, self-sacrificing type of attitude coming out of them where they believe they have to sacrifice everything in order to be godly. And both extremes I feel are major problems in terms of our development spiritually. Yeah. And, and I feel both extremes are quite hypocritical actually too. You know? And one, because they both are creating facades. They, you know, they, they, they create a facade on the religious stance or on the spiritual stance. Yep. All right. Well, um, you, want, you want to add one more? I wanted to mention something that sure. just came up. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about loving and unloving, but I think very few people actually have any idea about what love feels like. Yeah, I disagree with that completely, actually. Can I, can I explain why I do? Sure. Yeah. Um, and this is something that I feel is, a, is the crux of this conversation as well. I feel sometimes what we can finish up doing is using the excuse that I don't know what love is, so, and that then gives me the excuse to not be loving to other people. Now, if I can illustrate what love is, really quite simply, whatever you would like somebody to do to you, do to them. That's what, that's what love is. So what would you like from other people? You think about when you were a child, did you like getting smacked? How many of you loved getting a smack when you were a child? How many of you were sadomasochists <laughs> when you were children? Nobody, right, generally. So, so how many of us then smacked our own child? And can you see... If we, were, if we felt about the child and we have remembered our own childhood, we wouldn't have been able to smack our own child, would we? Because none of us loved it when we were a child. We, we were totally terrified of getting smacked when we were a child. Many of us, right? Many of you do not want to embrace this conversation now. And the, can you feel the resistance to even thinking about these things? You see... We want to tell ourselves that we don't know how to be loving and yet on the receiving end we do know what loving behaviour is. When we're receiving it, we know. You know when you're being treated lovingly a lot of the time on the receiving end. Right? You know when you have the feeling from somebody that they care about you on the receiving end. Right? So the reality is we do often know what love is, but we're unprepared to give it. And that indicates there's a lot of anger in us, there's this unpreparedness to give love that we do know is available even from within us. And we've got to, I feel, be very careful, Ella, to, of, of saying to ourselves that we don't really understand love. Because I do believe the majority of us 
do understand love. And in fact, I've met many people who have been even abused in their life and they still do understand in some areas in particular when they're being loved and when they don't. I can explain why I said that. Yep, far away. There is a, a chain of, <laughs> of thought. thought yep, far away um, with it. It's because uh, when I say that I go see Jesus, yep. people almost have an allergic reaction because they don't trust. Exactly. They don't trust anything anymore. Nothing, yes, I agree. And they don't trust that they can actually be happy and that love can be transmitted because people just get by actually. They are in some in betweeny state and they don't think they, that something overwhelming can ever happen to them. So that's could why I talked about not know, knowing what love actually feels like. Yeah, see, I would feel that's not about love. I feel that's about this emotion disillusionment. Where we're, we're all, we've all become dis. How do I spell it? One S. We're all disillusioned. In other words, we all, um, due to how we've been treated in our lives and, and, and very much how we've been treated in our childhood, we, we come to actually believe that while it's one thing to talk about love, we believe that, that love is not really possible in the world. So we start feeling it's impossible. And this is where we become disillusioned. Many of us do know the feelings of love, but we are completely disillusioned because many of us have very rarely felt the feelings of love in our life coming towards us from other people. And so we then also feel quite disillusioned that we're capable of loving other people without them loving us. We believe there's some kind of arrangement that we've got to have with it when it comes to love as well. So I feel this pro pro problem of disillusionment is a huge problem on the planet. And, and this is what causes people to have no trust because they are disillusioned with even the concept of trust. And when we look out in the world a lot of the times, because everybody is so focused on getting what they want out of a situation, we have all started to come to the point where we, the, the only thing we really trust is that the other person is going to take us for a ride. <laughs> you know, we believe that we're just going to get used. That's probably the only thing we do trust. And we've become so disillusioned with the power of love. We don't even believe it has any power anymore. Many of us have, have not you know, don't see any power of lo in love in our life as a result of what's happened to us generally. So I feel these are, these are the really big issues and the other issues that we listed, which included these other issues down the bottom of the board, these are the issues that are the effects of these issues. Right? Now, if we are sincere as a... As a in an individual discovering truth, if we are sincere, can you see that we must begin to sincerely address these particular issues in our day-to-day -day life? And these issues will naturally begin to fade away even in society. The more people who address these issues, the more these issues fade away. And unfortunately on the, in the world what I notice is that many people don't believe that just one person changing these things can change a world. But the reality is that that is the case. One person changing these things can change millions and millions of people. But it has to be a sincere change on the part of the one person for all of these things to change. And this is what I'd probably like to raise with you, each of you individually, is just ask yourself this question, am I sincerely addressing these things? Am I really wanting to address these things? And I, am I sincerely actually doing it? Or am I just trying to make out to myself that I'm doing it so that, it feel, so that I feel better? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? You see, one of the big problems we have on the planet today is we do a lot of things just to feel better. 
But a lot of the things we do have no major bearing on any real change. Huh? And, and I see this happening a lot. Um, and here's something that came up when we were in Gothenburg. There are many people who we meet now that are into raw food. Right? In other words, they believe wholeheartedly that ha having raw food is a loving thing to do for the environment, a loving thing to do for themselves, and, they, and so they do very little cooking anymore, mostly eat raw food, and they don't eat any meat, and they don't eat any meat, uh, um, animal products at all. And they're very focused on doing this raw food. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But I am saying this. Many of those same people are completely willing to get angry with their partner. Now, to me, which one's more important? One is having less anger towards animals and expressing less anger towards animals and expressing less like unloving behavior towards oneself and then the other is a preparedness to be angry with your partner a person a one of god's children actually so in terms of a priority system which one do you think god would rather you change first can you see surely this one would be the one God would want you to change first. But you see, that one's harder to change because it might have all sorts of reasons why you're angry with your partner, right? So it's much harder to change. It's, but it's a lot easier just to say, oh, I'm going to eat differently because that's an action you can take that has almost an instant result inside of yourself where, and you can make an instant choice and go ahead and do it. And very little emotionally has to change within you to do it. All right. Mary, you'd like to say? Yes. Uh, just on that point, I thought, um, I guess something else I encounter around people who have gone right into raw, just using the raw food example, there yep. are many examples. Yep. But um, it relates to the empire arrogance emotion. Yep. And the level of judgment towards someone else who might eat a potato chip or... Um, yes. There's, and for me that seems to be... a We've completely defeated the purpose of the loving action of the raw food if, if we are then in arrogance and also judgment of... Uh, Which are all else. very unloving emotions coming out mm -hmm. of us towards another person. It was interesting when we were in Sweden, um, I um, bought a bag of potatoes... And, um, and I cut them all up and I fry, fried them, like uh, uh, baked them in the oven. We, we spiced them all with, uh, what was it, curry and whatever, uh, things we, myself and Mary, like. And, and the comment made to us was, why are you cooking? And the answer I gave was, because I like it. <laughs> and and, and the, the question was, isn't it cancerous though? I said, what causes cancer? And they had to think about it for, oh, the emotions within a person. Yes, I said. <laughs> like, so I can eat this and not get cancer at all, right? Um, and I can enjoy the eating of this and not get cancer at all. But there was so much judgment. And, and, and yet, the very same persons judging me for eating my potatoes were actually, at the same time, very angry with me about something else that I had also said or done to them, right? And I'm going, which one's loving? Like, surely in terms of me cooking a potato and then a person being angry with one of God's children, from God's perspective, which one do you think is going to be worse? Which one's going to have more harm to your condition, to your soul condition, to your soul? To what, which one's going to have more of a negative effect on your rest of your life? Surely the one where you're dumping the rage on other people. And this is where I find many people going, is they change the things that are easy to change because the things that are hard to change, they believe are too hard to change. 
and, they, and yet they still want to feel like they're progressing. Right? And so when we change something that's easy to change, we can feel like, oh, I've made progress. When you say to somebody, well, what have you done in the last year in terms of your progress? Oh, I've become vegan. You know? And I go, yeah, but, like, how, what have you done in your heart, you know, to change? Like, what, where's, what's the love in action? And they said, well, I'm more loving to animals. I go, yes, no worries. That's very good. But how loving are you to your child? <laughs> Do you still yell at your child? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, so, in other words, you're perfectly okay to be loving towards animals, but when it comes to your child, you're not okay to be loving to your child. Right? And this is what happens inside of us. We choose to do things that are easier to do because we are unwilling to change the things that are harder to change. You see, these things, any anger involves our fear and most of us are still completely unwilling to address our fears. Right? Instead, we want them... At we want them met addiction with addictions. We want people to make our fears go away. We don't want to have to feel them and experience them. So what we finish up doing is we choose a spiritual path, what we think is a spiritual path. And by the way, becoming vegan is not a spiritual path. In the first century, I said to the person, it doesn't matter what goes into your body. From God's perspective, it barely matters in comparison to what comes out of your mouth in terms of what you say and do with others. Right? And why did I say that? Because most people get so focused on changing something that's quite minor and yet they are completely ignorant or wish to remain ignorant about changing the major thing. Right? Now, if sincere change is going to happen, if, if we're going to put our love in action, if sincere change is going to happen, it's going to have to happen by us changing some of these things, which are all major things. Right? And now many of us go, well, no, the monetary system is a major thing. I can't agree. The monetary system is an effect of many of us not changing these things collectively. It's an effect of our emotions of greed, for example. Our emotions of arrogance. Our emotions that we believe that people should give to us everything that we need rather than having to work for it. All of these things are all associated with the financial system. The whole reason why there is interest is because mankind has the idea that we should all receive something that we haven't earned. <laughs> right? And which is what interest is, receiving something you haven't earned. And all of us have that feeling. Many of us are still inside of us right now as we sit here, where we have that feeling where we should get things that we haven't earned ourselves, that we haven't worked for. And you look at many of our younger children now. You look at, have, have you had a look at the children around you here in Britain? How many of them expect their mums and dads to give them everything? none of which they've had to work for, none of which they've had to understand, none of which they've even had to say thank you for. Right? That is a big problem, isn't it? Yep. And we're just making it bigger as parents. Why are we doing it, making it bigger as parents? Because we're afraid of other people's opinions about whether we look like we're a good parent or not. <laughs> so we do it for that one emotion, many of us. And yet we're not really changing anything positively inside of us. And in fact, we're creating the degradation even further. So the very things that we criticise in, in the world are often the very things we are also creating in our own children. Exactly the same things. So we criticise the world for its demand on resources, but you go home and look at your children's actions. How many of our children are in the process of giving to others all the time? Or how many of them want to take all the time? Can you see that we're not willing to see the, the different, the, what's going on, Amanda? So are you saying that we need to have 
before even doing any changes at all. We need to have a sincere acceptance that our emotions drive everything that we're doing. Yes, not only a sincere acceptance that our emotions drive everything we do, but also then a sincere desire to change those emotions so that everything we do changes. And this is what I feel is lacking in the majority of people in the Western world. Right? There is not a sincere desire to change the emotional reason why we do things. Right? And that is a major problem. So can I reflect a little about your own life? Do you mind me doing that? Probably, but go you on. You do let's, mind? Let's have a go. Let's I won't go. do it then if you, don't, no, if you do mind. Go. No, I'm, I can't engage the process that somebody minds. <laughs> Not publicly anyway, privately I can. I'm just a bit afraid of what you might say. Yeah, yes, I know. <laughs> Which is just one of these things, isn't it? Isn't that the exact one that you raised? <laughs> as well, interestingly enough. Yeah. And can you see there's a bit of hypocrisy in that? You raise an issue that you've noticed, and yet when I engage a process with you to address one of your pains, you don't want to engage it. And that's all I'll say on the subject. And, and this is where we need to bear in mind, this is what's going on for the majority of us. You know? And, and we, when we stay with people, we notice this a lot often, when we stay with people, there's this noticing that we're all willing to notice the world and what it's doing wrong. Yep. Because we don't have to make a personal change when we do that. But if we notice the world and then come back to our own self and said, all right, there's something emotionally inside of me that created that thing in the world, now we'd have to be far more personally responsible for what's really going on. Did you know that right now there's some emotions in you right now that create the rape of women? Right now there's emotions in you that create that. Did you know there's emotions in you right now that are creating 50 million children dying of starvation every year? Right now there's emotions in you that are creating that. And yet when you read it in the newspaper you go, oh that's terrible. But are we sincere? You see, if we were sincere, we'd be going, that's really terrible. What emotion in me helps create this? Can you see, if I was really sincere, that's what I would do. Can you see that? It's and a difficult process, though, isn't it? If we can use the microphone. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's a difficult process to do. It well, is difficult because, for example, today I... I had a bit of an issue talking to a, a friend of mine who's lied to me for six years. And finally, knowing in my heart he's lied to me for six years. Yes, yes. Right? I really wanted to kick him. You really wanted to attack him, let's oh, call it, shall we? Life. But yeah. I sat there. Yeah. And I, I, I talked, I said, OK, is, what's the truth? What's the truth? What's the truth? And I had to sit there and breathe through my pain, my anger, yeah. and my physical desire to smack him <laughs> yeah and i mean a physical no this is good it's good always him. to be honest <laughs> and i breathed and i breathed and i said well why did you lie he said because one lie became three lies and yeah. then i had to keep those three lies going and then i fell in love with you and then i don't want you to leave and i know that if i told you that it was all a lie that you'd leave me right and i said i still love you how do you feel now? For me to say that with sincerity was really difficult. Well, I'm saying you didn't say it with sincerity, but go on. Because <laughs> you felt like smacking him, so it's not with sincerity. Even though I had to work out in that tiny moment, I sat and I breathed and I listened and yep. I breathed and I said, I love you, we'll sort this out. Yeah. Okay. But it wasn't said with sincerity. I'll actually address that with you at okay. later. Continue. <laughs> okay. okay. That's what I'm saying. That process yep. of sincerity is a difficult one to have. Very okay. difficult. I so agree. Very difficult. It's not easy for a human being to monitor every single emotion to that extent, surely. Well, let's look at that comment as well. Okay. Firstly, if, if the human being had no emotional injuries, then there would be no negative emotion to monitor, 
which would be a very sim simple life, wouldn't it? Yeah. You wouldn't have to monitor anything. So that's the way God intended us to operate in the long run. So, so if we look at that as the perfection, if you like, the fact that we don't have to monitor any emotion and we'd be loving all the time, that's the end result of becoming at one with God. That's what we can do. Yeah. So that's our possibility. Let's go back one step from that. The reality is we have emotions inside of us that are out of harmony with love. I agree. Now, if the most intelligent supreme being that God's ever created can't monitor their own emotions, can they really do anything? If you think about it. If the most, you see, I feel the reason why we make statements like that is because we don't want to monitor our own emotions. We don't want to take full responsibility for what we really feel and then have to dig into the depths of it. You know, that, that emotion you had of wanting to snot him, right? Yes. That emotion, digging into the depths of it, not controlling it, but rather digging into the... So after you've finished the conversation with him, digging into the depths of it, why did I feel so angry with him that I wanted to hit him? And actually digging right down into the depths of it and finding the real reason. Then if you dealt with that real reason, can you see that somebody could lie to you for 20 years and then tell you the truth and you'd have no trouble with it if you dealt with the real reason? And in fact, to be frank, if they lied to you for 20 years, you'd probably know for the whole 20 years that they've been lying to you. I have known for the last six years that he's been lying to me and I've been waiting and you know, gently prodding him to, to talk truth. Yes, um, but then you've got to ask yourself, well, why didn't you just come out straight and just say, you're lying to me? Yeah, it didn't quite work like that. <laughs> say that as well. Yeah. Come on, just tell me the truth, you're lying. When you, you know. But his denial and fear just ran off then. I agree, but that doesn't change your behaviour. See, what you're, again, what we do is this. We don't see our own participation in what's happened. So there is a reason... So, so you're going to tell me what to do now because I'm still processing this because I haven't quite given him an answer yet. No, I'm not going to tell you what oh, to do. Because <laughs> I, uh, well, well, I can't do that. Like, okay. But I can tell you the principles involved. For yourself, there has to be a reason why he was so afraid to tell you the truth. And can you feel your resistance to that statement? Because I know what it is. You know what it is? If you put the mic on. I so think because I'm quite an opinionated woman. Yeah. Uh -huh. Keep quite going. intimidating at times. You can be, and you do it on purpose at times. True. Why? Uh, so you haven't found out why yet? No? Because I was, because I was abused mentally and physically and sexually yes yeah, yeah so now it is a kind of a um i suppose a defense right to make against. sure that i am secure yep. and i've got foundations okay defensive against getting hurt more yes Isn't it? yes yes good so continue <laughs> <laughs> and you know and to me it's all you know it's about clear statements and i'm very vocal and I'm very expressive with my feelings sometimes. Well, the reality is that you're still very angry about what's happened to you. And this is what's driving you being vocal and expressive of what you call your feelings at times. Okay. Does that make sense? So this anger is already coming out of you before a person meets you. you, you as you're walking up to them, they're feeling it. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So at the soul level, they're already afraid. Of me? Yes. Does that make sense? No, I'm not, but the average person would be, right? <laughs> the fact that I'm having this conversation means I'm not. But, but the average person would be. So, so, and particularly a male who understands that actually much of this abuse that you're angry about came from a male. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And so therefore, the male is already like going, whoa, like, I, like I'm already afraid. Now, can you see, because he's already afraid, he's going to choose to do some things out of harmony with love himself as a result of his own fear. But that's his stuff. 
your stuff is the fact that because there's the anger present there inside of you yet to be released about these events, these old events, the person feels that anger as a potential and then misinterprets it all as applying to them somehow. Do you understand? And so then they make a heap of choice and decision based on that. If there was no anger coming out of you at all, do you think there might have been a higher likelihood of him saying the truth earlier on? See, that's the question. Now, my feelings are, yes, there is a higher likelihood. It doesn't mean that he would have. I'm saying there's a higher likelihood yeah, he would have. I would say there was a potential. Because he is an intelligent man. Of course. And he realises sooner or later he's going to get caught out, right? Yep. He's been caught out a few times. He just denies. Yes. But today he actually had the courage to... Admit it. So his problem is probably coming from his childhood where he uh, was taught how to lie by having the threat of punishment if he, if he told the truth and somebody punishing him if he, when he did tell the truth is probably what's caused his desire to lie. But again, he has to address that. We're speaking about your emotions that create something. And this is what I'm saying is everything that happens in the world around you that you even notice happening is all about something inside of ourselves that is yet to heal. So the sincerity... Yes. Let's, yeah. Should I have to heal that last little bit of anger um, and then I could be more sincere? You're not even being sincere in the statement. Okay. Because it's it. a mountain of anger that I can feel in you and you called it the oh, last no. little bit. <laughs> Does that make sense? And yet I can feel it's a lot more than the last little bit. So, so I'm not going to admit that right in front of everybody. I've got massive sort of bad so you're, to do. So you're also afraid of people's opinion now? <laughs> no, I just don't want to disturb them or upset them. No, you're afraid of their opinion. Oh, okay. Thanks. Otherwise you would freely admit things. Do you understand? Okay. And this is another thing that you then just fibbed about. <laughs> Can you see how this, this web of insincerity is sort of in us, like almost? Like it's a, we, we go from one insincerity to the next one to the next one in a matter of moments, right? And that's what I'm trying to get across to you, is that, is that we, we finish up telling ourselves so many things just in order to avoid... Seriously, she so now it's a hand the mic around somewhere else. <laughs> and that's good. <laughs> I can feel like, oh, I don't want him to say any more now. Can you feel that emotion? Oh, no, I've got a tear coming from my eye. <laughs> but I, right, I'm not uh, picking on you, though. I'm just saying that we, this is where each of us need to go. I'm, I'm very glad you engaged that process with me. Because, it, because what it illustrates is that the majority of us are doing this. Like, so it's not just yourself. The majority of us are doing this. And what we do is we skip from one insincere moment to the next insincere moment, just with a few words. And if there's not somebody... And unfortunately, because most of us allow it to occur with each other automatically... We, we are so used to doing it that even many of us know when the other person's being insincere and yet we accept it. We just go along with the whole thing. Right? And I'm saying if we had more love in action, we would not even accept the insincerity in ourselves, let alone the insincerity in another. Right? We wouldn't go that. So, so when I go, yes, uh, if I've got, have I still got a little thing to heal or a big thing to heal about this particular issue? I would know whether it's little or big inside of myself because I, I wouldn't want to tell myself a fib because if I tell myself a lie, it's now going to make my job much more difficult to find the real thing that's there. So um, if I can illustrate that, babe, with your and I relationship, for quite a number of times... I've mentioned to Mary that there is still anger in her towards men. And Mary has said to me over the last few months in particular, Mary had released a lot of her anger and she felt like there wasn't much anger left anymore towards men. I want to pass Mary the mic because it would be good to get some of her comments about this. And yet over the last couple of days we've had some discussions and what have you found, babe? 
Yeah, lots of anger. Lots of anger towards men. So, so what I'm illustrating is it's so easy to tell ourselves a series of things just because we want to believe it. But that's not being sincere. Right? The sincere take would be to find out exactly the truth of what's really going on. That would be sincere. To do anything else is actually hypocritical. Every time we minimise our action or we shift the blame or we say it's some, some other cause, and it can be even extreme causes. Like When I say extreme causes, we could have had terrible things happen in our childhood or so forth that is still not a good reason to stop putting love in action. Right? And, and what we've got to do individually is stop this process of justifying our behaviour to ourselves and to others and begin being very sincere about everything that happens in our lives and all the things that are going on in our lives. Because if we don't change many of these really big things, the other things that we listed, which are all to do with the, the world's effects of individuals doing this. So you could say, this is what individuals are doing to each other. That created all of the monetary system, all of the medical system, all of the food production system, all, all of these systems that we have, which are all globally created now, have all come from these emotions that exist within us that are unloving. And unless we have a sincere desire to see our own part in it, Nothing will change. Nothing. And it requires, a, and this is what I wanted to probably state, is that it requires so much sincerity to become at one with God. If your goal is to become at one with God at some point in the future, there is a dire need to become very sincere in every single thing that you do. Right? You're not going to be able to get there by being insincere with yourself or with another person. That that will prevent the whole thing from happening. Now, for many of us, what happens is that when I say a statement like that, we then go, "Oh, it's all too hard." Then, <laughs> you know, we go, "It's all too hard." Then, and and we give up or whatever. And I do feel, that in fact, that uh, many people around the world, like in the process of the last six or seven years, I've probably talked to, I don't know how many people, if you add up the DVDs and everything else that's been, probably now millions of people have heard the divine truth. We've given away nearly 200,000 DVDs, which all get freely copied. There's all the YouTube stuff. There's a, there's a hundred and... I think there was two, 250,000 views nearly on YouTube. You know, there's thousands of people who have heard the divine truth around the planet. And yet, very few people make the transition from hearing it into becoming more loving themselves personally. Uh, one of the batteries is probably going on one of those. Yeah. Don't move too much. Don't move too much. <laughs> well, it's pretty hard if you're going to get up and do it. We can use the other mic until the break. Yeah, that's all right. So, so um, can, it, can everyone see the, the importance of just how important it is to start saying to ourselves, okay, we are so used to being hypocritical. In fact, our entire environment is geared towards creating hypocrisy. You know, creating facade, creating a person that we're not, being a person that we're not. In fact, people accept us being the person we're not more than they accept us being the person we are. Isn't that the truth? And so, and so the whole world is geared towards hypocrisy. Now, if we're ever going to become at one with God, we're going to have to gear our entire world, our entire life, 
our entire way of living, our entire way of thinking, our entire way of speaking and our entire way of acting into harmony with sincerity. That's what we're going to have to do if we want to become at one with God. And by the way, it's not only if that, it's also if we want to be really happy, we're going to have to do that. If we're really ever going to know ourselves, we're going to have to do that. If we're ever really going to know our partner, he has to do that. Can you see? Like, how can you know someone if they're not, if there's always a facade? There's always some kind of, you know, image or some kind of hypocrisy happening. And what I would like to encourage you to do is instead of, instead of going down this track of trying to justify things that you do and sort of letting yourself get away with the hypocrisy, instead start letting yourself desire sincerity all the time in your life, everywhere, whatever you do. If you desire sincerity, you will challenge the fear that you have that causes you to not be sincere. But you've got to desire it. But, but to be frank, if you don't desire it, you don't have any chance of ever knowing yourself and you don't have ever cha any chance of ever knowing a partner that you might attract into your life and you don't have any chance of ever being at one with God unless you desire it. So to me, like as soon as I list those three things and I go, wow, that's a lot of things that I'm missing in my life if I don't have sincerity, then that causes me to be very self-reflective. So very few people have to tell me anything about myself before I, and that I haven't already noticed. Does that make sense? Because of the sincerity. And if you develop that kind of sincerity where Nobody needs to even tell you anything about yourself that you haven't already seen and aren't already working on. Then you'll find you'll progress very, very rapidly towards love and towards God. And then you could say, once you do that, your love gets into action pretty rapidly then because everyone around you can feel your sincerity. Everyone around can feel the changes that are happening in you. And remember I said right at the beginning, you list all those areas of your life and anyone looking at any of those areas in life saying, yeah, she's changed here. Yes, he's changed here. I can see he's changed there. This is a guy who's sincere about his spiritual pro progress right? because he's more loving or she is more loving in the way she interacts with me. And this is proof that she's sincere or he's sincere. Jeff? Um, do you think it's... I just wanted to raise the one of fear of people's opinion. Yes. Because um, I think it's yeah, certainly really big for me. It is, I think yes. For a lot of people. Um, is it true to say that the more sincere and truthful you are about your own condition, that the, the less fear you'll have about people's opinion? Yes. Yeah. Very much so. It's yeah. a very good observation. Does anyone understand what Justice said? Basically what she said was, if I am very sincere with everyone around me about my condition, then I'll no longer be afraid of other people's opinion. Because the only reason why I'm afraid of other people's opinion is because I want them to have a different opinion to my own viewpoint of what I am. That's the only reason why I'm afraid of their opinion. I want them to think that I'm a different person than I am. Right? So if I'm very sincere about my own condition with everything. So, so in other words, I asked many of you ladies, are you angry with men? And you go, yes, I'm extremely angry with men. You know, that's, if that's how you feel, you say it. But that's sincerity about your own condition. Does that make sense? And in fact, without sincerity of your own condition, nothing can change anyway. Because you, 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 you will overlook it. You, you, you'll dismiss it. And if I ask many of you men, how many of you men pander to women all the time? You, you know, you give them what they want all the time so that you can be happy and get a bit of sex. And many of you guys have to put your hand up with that one, right? And so you, then you can say, okay, there's an insincere thing going on there that we need to address. But the fact of putting your hand up and owning up to, and not only doing it because you're asked, but also doing it voluntarily, right? it, it, it relieves you of so many things in your life. It relieves you of other people's opinion. 
You no longer, you'll find that even though you're afraid of their opinion, they won't have a different opinion of you than what you've already told them because you've told them the truth about yourself. <laughs> so it's impossible for them to have a different opinion than what you've already told them. So recently I had a really big event happen um, for me where um, a, a friend called up and did have a very, very bad opinion of me mm -hmm. and it came out in a really angry way. And for the first time I was able to really see it as a you know as an opportunity to be like to find out more about myself and yep. see what I was responsible for in that which was a lot yeah <laughs> so it was a really humbling experience and I really for the first time really called on prayer to help me have the love and I knew what love should do and I did it and yep. I had the courage to do it and it was really beautiful what happened afterwards exactly and I'm sitting with those emotions that I still have lots to work through that, yep. that I created that situation um, but I still and can I also point out that you also ended up with a feeling of pride in yourself yeah. that you could actually admit yeah. that yes this is a problem and, and, and did you feel the, the way it sort of when you interact with a person and you actually admit that it is a problem when it is a problem can you feel how they there's so all of the power out of their rage generally sort of oftentimes just disappears and turns into tears usually, yeah and then allows them to process exactly yeah. Yeah. exactly that's the beauty of it yeah. yeah but i still feel like there's um i have this like unspecific fear where for example walking in here i just immediately start shutting down and act differently to how i w how i feel in my heart because i'm scared of some kind of judgment and i don't know what that is um, well, what, what happens in, in now with all of the seminars that we give, there's a group of spirits uh, who are around myself and Mary constantly now, and their entire goal is to try to shut down anybody who comes to a seminar. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. because, it, because if anybody comes to a seminar and they feel shut down, there's a high likelihood they won't go to the seminar again. So, so what they do, these spirits, is they look for individual holes in each of us where we're afraid. Right, where we have a fear of some kind, and then they project that through that opening their rage or, or an emotion that they have. And that causes us to fear, but we don't even know what we're afraid of. Now, many people who attend the seminars are now experiencing this, where they walk in a seminar and they're all of a sudden afraid and they don't even know why they're afraid. Mm. Right? Now, if an event has occurred on Earth right in the moment that you're afraid and you know you're afraid. You can sort of associate the event with the fear, right? But when we have no event on earth that seems to have happened and yet we walk into a place and we're afraid, then that usually means that there are a whole group of spirits influencing our fear. Does that make sense? They are now placing pressure on us in some way. Now, if the fear is of other people's opinion, they will cause us to be afraid of that when we walk in the room. But if our fear is of getting hurt, then they'll be afraid of that. If our fear is of speaking up, then they'll cause us to shut down. We've had whole seminars recently where, where before, when I gave the seminar in that location, everybody was open, talking, asking questions, every, everybody was involved. The same people come along to another seminar and nobody says a word. It's like... Like, and I ask questions and there's no response from the audience and it's like, what's going on? And what's happening is that the, audi the audience is hooking to these spirits and what the spirits are projecting at them. So that still indicates there's a hole in the person. Does that make sense? And uh, what you're feeling in that situation is related to the hole. Exactly. Right yeah, or the addiction you have with that particular kind of spirit. So, for example, if you're afraid of women then women's spirits might come to you and project anger at you and then all of a sudden you're afraid. Does that make sense? So, so in that moment, the whole is that you're afraid of women and you want to please them. And that's the opening that they have. All they've got to do is be angry with you a bit and they know that you'll please them. So if they're angry with you every time you put your hand up, you'll feel their anger and then you'll go, oh, I'm afraid of all of a sudden. Does that make sense? And then that causes you to not engage. This is happening a lot now. But the reason why it's happening a lot is because more and more spirits do not want any of this divine truth to be known on the earth. And so what they do is they spend a lot of their time coming around with myself and Mary. We feel them almost at every venue. Well, we feel them at every venue now. Where there's just large groups of spirits trying to manipulate and control the audience so the audience does not engage. 
but it's all about the audience's fear in the end. Fear of something, right? So it's fear of something. And usually a lot of it's fear of people's opinions of them or other... And will that always relate to childhood experiences where you had an opinion given to you? Or? It will always relate to something in your childhood emotionally, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's about the particular thing. So, for example, with our, many of us in our childhood, the way our parents learned to control us, because after a while smacking didn't work that well, was they learned to embarrass us. And that works very well. Most people get uh, alla- uh, are easily controlled by being embarrassed. So, for example, a parent learns to tell a private thing that the child had to their friends in public, and so the child feels embarrassed as a method to imp- punish them, for example. And so then there's a fear that develops in the childhood a- a- as to t- telling the truth in public. Right? And so when the per- person grows up and comes along to a seminar like this, then there's an automatic fear present there of telling the truth in public about their own life. And then when I start engaging a question series, just like I did with you just earlier, there's this automatic fear that comes up about, you know, oh, my, my, my faults being exposed in public, you know, I'm going to be humiliated, I'm going to be embarrassed, I'm going to, you know, people are going to think I'm a bad person. And, and all of those things are all from childhood experiences. Otherwise, we wouldn't be afraid of them. Yeah. It's good. So again, it's a matter of being sincere about what's really going on. So, so probably in conclusion with this particular talk that I wanted to give is if we look at this word sincerity, the way God views sincerity is very fine, like um, right down to the most tight description you could think of with regard to sincerity is how God sees sincerity. God wants us to be sincere in every aspect of our being, in every aspect of our life, to ourselves, to others and to God. That's what God wants with regard to our sincerity. When we're like that, then we will actually finish up portraying ourselves to the world exactly as we are. All of our faults will be present, all of our truths will be present, everything will be present in in exactly as we are. And if we're truly sincere, we won't justify what we are that's out of harmony with love. We will always look at it and go, I want to change that, and we'll have a sincere desire to change it even. We'll, We'll be wanting to change that particular thing that's wrong. When we're not sincere, and rather when we're hypocritical, what we do instead is we always finish up justifying, shifting the blame, manoeuvring around it, trying to you know, portray ourselves to be something that we're not, and we're always trying to slip out of it. We're, we're a bit slimy. Have you ever tried to pick up a worm without hurting it? It's like that, you know, that's what we're like a lot of the times emotionally. We're, we're constantly engaged in this process of trying to avoid and slip out of things. And if we truly loved ourselves, we would never do that. And if we truly loved others, we would never do it either. And this is where we have to become very, very sincere if we really want to progress. Now... The reason why I've raised, that, raised this issue here is because I feel in the society here a very strong resistance to sincerity. And, and for that reason I feel divine truth in England will not grow until some of you choose to be very sincere. Because without there being an example, then, then nothing can grow. And, and so it's, what, what I feel instead from many is a deep fear about being sincere. Afraid of even coming along to a session just in case you might get exposed is one of those issues. Right? And there's a real strong fear about being sincere in esp- every aspect of your life. If you embrace sincerity in every aspect of your life people around you will automatically feel a difference from you and they will automatically want to know why. 
And this is great opportunities to share the truth with them that you have enjoyed just through that process. But if you keep avoiding sincerity, then they'll look at you and go, yeah, they go along to that and watch that Jesus fellow stuff, right? right? But look at them. They're just as bad as they always have been. Right? And would you, if you were one of those people who were looking at that Jesus fellow stuff, would you go, would you go, would you know like you want to know more about the divine truth? If, if that happened, if you saw a person who's going along being insincere and untruthful and everything all the time, what would you do? Wouldn't you say exactly the same as what most people say? And that is, this doesn't change anybody's life positively. That's what you would do, wouldn't it? If we have the mic uh, around there. So. Thanks, Jess. Kind of reminds me of keeping up appearances. There is actually a program here. In Britain yes, I've seen it that. actually. It's very and then funny. Yeah. It reminds me of um, um, Through the Mists, where Alfred sees the young girl in the house. Um, is the book group, if nobody knows what yes. we're talking about. Yeah. Um, where Alfred sees the, the, the girl in the, in the house, and then that girl talks about her past and what has happened to her. And how jealous she was and what she did in her rage. And yes, yes, and she, she had everything. She was of a wealthy family and she had everything given to her and, and how she pursued uh, her, her anger, her angry emotions. Yes. Um, so it kind of brings, I know they're two different things, but the, the, the emotions, I think, they're quite the same because... Yes. Um, she obviously felt that she had the right to have those things. And I think sometimes here in the UK, people feel that they have the right to have things. And uh, if, if they don't have, if they, they can't afford it, they will still keep up the appearances of uh, still going down the pub and saying that everything is fine. Yeah. And um, if in Brazil, there is a saying, well, um, when, when you're going to do a job, which is only for facade, w w you don't fix the, the thing really. Yeah. You say um, para inglês ver, which means for English to see. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you ever heard that, but it's, it's if, very interesting. If you call isn't like, it? a boiler to be fixed, and yeah. the guy just make, makes it up that he's fixed it, yeah. and it's just. just so the English can see that I'll fix yeah, it. Yeah, because it's a facade, it's just. Um, yeah. It looks fixed, yeah. but it's yeah. not really. Yeah. It's yeah, very interesting you raise that. And the reason why I looked at Mike, who's behind the camera, was because we were talking about this very thing in the car on the way here, how um, there is this deep expectation in English society that everyone gets exactly what they want, no matter what their price range. So one thing I've noticed a lot last time we were here is that very poor people were driving around with BMWs. And, we, and, and in Australia, it's very rare to see a BMW because a person who has a BMW probably is quite wealthy. And yet here you see very poor people driving around with BMWs, Mercedes and all those kind of things. And, and you can see straight away that, yeah, there's this desire for the facade, the desire for, you know, they want that vehicle rather than a vehicle that will just do the job. They want to have some kind of feeling that, they deserve that vehicle and, and there's many other emotions that drive it as well. And it's interesting how you, you've got that saying, Brazil. We're going to Brazil next, next, next month. Uh, sorry, if you... Yeah. Um, it's very... Um, the stiff upper lip is a big thing. Stiff upper lip? Yeah. How does that look? <laughs> uh, <Yeah>. Go on. <laughs> no, it's, it's, um, <laughs> it fits in with that. That's yeah. What, yeah. Yeah. yeah, very true. Keeping up appearances. Keeping up appearances, yeah. Stiff upper lip. Yeah. Whatever. Isn't it interesting how humour in television is often taking off things that are prevalent in the society in which the humour is developed? Yeah, and you see that all the time as well. Um, I've been trying to be more sincere, authentic um, for about the last year and you're getting there in, in some things and obviously other things to do. What I get a bit unsure about is um, also about being in truth with someone. So um, I've had um, a really interesting journey with my soulmate since I met him. Yeah. Um, and things that went very difficult. Now, something happened where I felt very hurt recently. 
Where did you find the line between being honest about your anger and frustrations and then also trying to maintain that loving thing as well? I mean, I, obviously, I know I take ownership of the fact that my anger is related to, I'm realising, anger at men, and that goes back to my yep. father and things. But, um, yeah, it's just how to relate the truth but do it in a kind of more productive way, if that's the right way. So, you know, not pretend you're not feeling something. Always tell the truth. Always. Okay. So, so if you're angry with him, you say, look, I'm very angry with you. Okay. And, the re and do you want to know the reason why I'm angry with you? Or, and, and then you can work your way through that and talk about why you're angry. And if you're truly connected and sincere about the emotion, you may finish up connecting to the sadness that's driving your anger while you're even talking about it. Yes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. but, but if you don't tell the truth at all, and if you say, oh, I'm, just, I'm not allowed to be angry, so... So I'll, I'll just try to cover over that anger and I'll try to act like I'm not angry and whatever. Now what's happening? Now you've got no opportunity. You're not telling the truth. Mm. So you're already in a facade yourself, which is yeah. an additional problem. And then on top of that, you're not connected with the emotion because you're trying to detune from the emotion. Mm. You're also not saying the truth to the other person. Now I'm not suggesting you go and... I'm angry with you and want to hit them and punch them. And, and I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you need to at least say you're very angry and at least connect with the reason why you're very angry. Now, in some cases, why you're very angry won't be fair to him at all. Right? In that he might have done nothing to deserve this anger and you've just interpreted it. But at least if you voice, I'm very angry right now, and you can even say, I'm very angry right now, and I... I don't even know why. Like, <laughs> you know, you can even say that if you don't know why. That is, mo that is more being yourself mm. than trying to cover over the fact even that you're angry. I'm getting better at expressing anger, as you probably picked up. I have a fear of, of that. I had it suppressed a lot as a child. Yep. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm getting better, I think, at uh, doing that. But, yeah, so for me, you know, to express anger, has, there's other layers to it as well for me. But I'm aware of that and I'm kind of, you know, but... Yeah. So always tell the truth, okay. Always. Yeah. Always, every single moment, always. I, do, I, I have a concern about hurting people um, in that space. but um. Yeah, most people do. But if you always tell the truth, you actually are g raising the potential to never hurt another person. Because a lot of times we get hurt by people not telling the truth. Isn't that the case? Yeah, you're right, actually, yeah. Yep. Which so is what's hurt me, yeah, him not... Yeah, okay. Exactly. So him not telling the truth is what caused mm. some of your hurt. Mm. And can you see that if you just don't tell the truth back, you're potentially causing some of his hurt? Okay, so I was okay what I told him last night then. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean? But there's more, there's, I feel there's more for me to say, but I don't, I, I, yeah. So tell the real truth about what you feel. You okay. see, what we do in relationships, and this, uh, uh, we have big issues with facade in relationships. We're not prepared to say exactly the thing that we feel from the person. So if you feel that you're not being valued at all if, through what happened with regard to the truth, then you say, look, the reality is I feel that I'm not being valued at all. You say exactly what you feel. The beauty of that is the other person doesn't have to go around guessing what you feel. Mm. They know exactly what you feel. In addition, you're not trying to guess what you feel because you're not, you, you've gotten rid of the layers where you're, you know, where you're trying to maintain a facade of something you're not, mm. you're not really. And then you've both got the opportunity to address the actual issue. Yes. Right? If the actual issue is one of you has lied to the other, then you've got, both got the opportunity now to address the actual issue. One person from the hurt they felt, the other person from the reason why they did it. You've both got the opportunity to address it. Not if you fly off the handle of each other, obviously, but you've got the opportunity to address it if you're truthful about what's going on. Yeah, he, he kind of shuts down a lot. So, um, so you tell him, you shut down all the time. Yeah, no, I do. <laughs> you just hit the thing underneath the anger the, about being valued. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. if I live with a person who is shut down all the time, I'd say, look, you're shut down all the time, and who am I living with? I want to live with a person who's themselves. I want you to be yourself. And, and if there's any reason inside of me why you're afraid of being yourself, you tell me what it is, right? Because I want you to be yourself. Stop shutting yourself down. If you're going to keep shutting yourself down and there's nothing inside of me that causes you to do it, then we've got to consider why we're in a relationship. 
Because a relationship is a to and fro thing. It's a thing back and forth where we actually relate. And yeah. one, that means both of us not shutting ourselves down, but both of us opening ourselves up. Now, if you want to do that, and I want to do that, then we'll have a relationship. Mm. But if you don't want to do that, then we've got to look at whether we, we, we have a relationship. And the, the reality is, I feel, that if more of us were sincere, we'd, we'd look at what we'd call relationship breakers. Mm. And we'd find in the course of a day, a hundred of them. Well, I, I, we are a part of the moment because of those very reasons that I'm yeah. willing to open and he's not. And yeah. You know, so. and, and if we were truly honest and truthful in our relationships, in the course of a day, we'd have hundreds of relationship breaker issues that come up and we'd actually sincerely address them mm. rather than running away from them. If we were both sincere about the relationship and sincere about loving each other, that's what we would do. It's when we're not sincere or one of us is not sincere, now we have a problem and we need to even address that. If the other person notices that we're not being sincere, then say, look, I don't feel you're being sincere. Be honest. You know, and, and honesty is always going to be crack facade. It always cracks hypocrisy. That's a beautiful part of honesty. It's a, it's a deep, important part of sincerity, to be honest. Yeah, I don't want my facades anymore, so I'm, I'm yep. you know, in the process of cracking mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I point out, though, it's, it's often, often we say that, mm. right, but... Um, the reality is when it comes to translating our love into action, that's where the test really is. You see, if, our, if we can't act in a loving manner, then, then that's telling, automatically, right? Then that's telling me that I still have some, some facade somewhere. So if it's not automatic for me to tell the truth, there's still a facade. If it's not automatically for me to say exactly what I'm feeling at every single moment in, in my relationship with my partner, then I still have a facade with my partner. If it's not automatic for me to do it with you, then I still have a, have a facade with general acquaintances. If it's, if it's not automatically happening with my friends, then I have a facade when it comes to maintaining my friendships. And if I can break through my facades, I'll find every emotional reason in me that's out of harmony with love. And heal it. I've got an opportunity to heal it. It's interesting as well because I've got um, a friend who listens to you a lot, and and she would, has said to me, "Don't just speak to him. Wait till you've processed your own stuff in this first before you speak." So I've held back. Why would you do that? Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm just wondering. She's, there's a, maybe a misinterpretation on that. On that, um, of that. Yeah, to me that is very poor advice. Yeah. Right? The, the reality is we want to engage situations without... And even if there's a risk in engaging the situation, we still want to engage it. Okay. Because that's the only way we're going to grow and learn. So I need to trust myself more. Yes. Those, yeah, yes. And, and the advice your friend gave in that instance is not very good advice. And if she's following her own advice, it's not very good for her. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, because in the end, we want to be ourselves. We want to learn how to be ourselves. That means learning to have your personality shine. Like... Learning to just be completely exactly who you are without any holes barred, you know, and that that's a that means you are actually putting the yourself on the line emotionally, and a person who's sincere does that every single moment of their day. They put themselves on the line every single moment of their day. And one person doing that has a big effect in the world. Yes, a huge effect. Well, you, th you, th you think about what's attracted you to the divine truth. Is it just me spouting divine truth? Isn't it also my sincerity when I deal with you? Yes. Yeah. And my sincerity when I deal with other people in the yeah. audience? Absolutely. Yeah. So it has a big effect, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So for many people, many people who first hear the divine truth coming from a guy who's claiming to be Jesus would never listen to it unless there was at least some level of sincerity. And it's exactly the same with yourself with telling the truth and living your life and telling the truth. It's the sincerity that you have that will just draw people to you in your life. If there's not sincerity, then it will repel people. Yeah. And in the end, you end up with a society very similar to the society you have here in England, which is very insular, where people are not very connected to each other. Even next-door neighbours don't really know each other. 
And the reason why is because we're not being our sincere, true selves with each other. And so nobody really knows who anybody is anymore. And you think of the average relationship. Isn't it much the same? You can live with somebody for 10 years in some Western societies and still not really know who they are or what they do. Yeah. And I, I, it, it constantly amazes me that that's the way it is. Michael didn't even turn off his phone. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, so, so can you see it's very important to have this... Like, and, and can I point out that if actions are not changing in our life, then that is a measure of our insincerity. So, so in other words, the, our life should be changing at any single moment. If we measure our life this week compared to last week, there should have been some change if we're sincere. If there's no change in the last three months or six months, then we're not being sincere about truth and we're not being sincere about desiring to love more. And what I see a lot of people doing, if, if you could imagine it like this, let's say this is a person and this is the growth in love that they can make and that is also the growth in truth that they can make. What I see many people doing with their lives is they are shifting this way. In other words... They are just embracing another idea, another concept, another way of doing things, another, and embracing all these different things. And it makes them feel like they're progressing, but the reality is, in terms of true progress, and the only true progress is our ability to grow in truth and love, right? in terms of true progress, they haven't shifted from this place all that time. And I see many people going from one uh, co spiritual concept to another spiritual concept to another spiritual concept to another spiritual concept, thinking that they're progressing. And the reality is, if you analyse them from a condition of love, they've not changed at all in that entire time. And that is the problem with a lot of our um, way of doing things with regard to spiritual progress, is that we believe that if we've changed, that we've actually progressed. Right? The reality is it's only if we've increased with the amount of love and truth that we express, that's when we've progressed. Yep. And this is where we've got to be very careful with ourselves. We often feel that just because things are changing, it means that we're doing good. And we sort of hold our chest out. I'm going good. I've got it down pat. I know the truth. And then, and then this is what I find with many people who discover divine truth. So they discover the divine truth at this point in their life. But they have complete unwillingness, many of them, to give up their addictions. And so what finishes up happening? They get this big arrogance in themselves that they've actually done something and now they know the truth and isn't it wonderful and they start dumping on other people that they don't know the truth and I know the truth and you're useless if you don't practice this truth and on they go and on they go and on they go and we've met many people like this and what's happening is their condition of love is actually going backwards now. Their own arrogance is actually making their condition of love go down now. And, and isn't that a shame? They discover divine truth and because of their attitude to it and not wanting to change sincerely inside of their heart, that their own condition of love regresses and gets even worse. And there's been people where that's happened. We, we have friends from our first century life who are still in the hills because of that. 2,000 years later, there are people we knew 2,000 years ago who now, 2,000 years later, are still in the hells, even though we knew them in the first century, and they heard all this divine truth. They heard many of the things I'm teaching you now, they've heard, and they're still in the hells. Because they didn't learn one thing, and that is that true progression is about love and truth. It's not about anything else. Right? And this is what we need to understand. Yeah. I get confused sometimes about um, what um, what I should do, what is loving, because um, like this example I gave before about vaccinations, 
Um, well, can, can I st stop you? With the question about vaccinations, it's quite simple. Do you like having a vaccination? You, use the mic. Oh, sorry. No. Um, no. So, is it loving to force your child to have one? No. There's the answer. But I get told. <laughs> I know what you I get don't told. If I vaccinate my child, they're going to die of polio and you'll be. A, and yeah, so now what's happening? Somebody I'm is playing. And I get fearful. Exactly. Yeah. And now somebody in authority teach it, tells you a heap of things that, that trigger your fear. And now you're out of that very simple question that I asked. The very simple question is, would I want to have done to me something that I'm going to do to somebody else? Do I? That's the simple question. It's a simple question of ethics. So if I, if I then did vaccinate my child knowing that it was unloving and then would the consequences on me be um, <laughs> um, it's like I've hurt someone of course then, you have yes yeah. yeah and you can't even say you haven't like you can justify it by going well the doctor told me that yeah. such and such but see it's a question of ethics see this is where love has to be in action it's a question of ethics would you want somebody to come along with a needle and stick it in your arm and jab you with something. Do you, did you like that when you were a child? So the fact that my mother did um, let that happen to me, that was unloving of her. Of course, because she didn't like having it happening to her when she was a child. But I mean, how can you know? Just by going by the feeling. It's quite simple, isn't it? And it's interesting, you don't even want to answer the feeling. You don't. I've asked you the question three times and you've still not answered the question. Oh. Whether you would like to have it done to you. Actually, one time I actually went to have an, a vaccination. I understand I that. So but, but did you like it? <laughs> um, <laughs> not yes. particularly. No, so would you like it? Would but I thought it was protecting me. Ah, but see, now you're using your intellect and your fear to guide your action. That's what you're doing now. Okay, so you should always just follow the feeling and no, not you, what other people tell you. No, no, I, I didn't say that at all. What did I say? Ask yourself whether you would like to have the same thing done to you. And if the answer is no, then don't do it to somebody else. <laughs> Very simple. All, that's all you've got to ask. That's what sincerity would do. You would just ask that simple one ethical question. You wouldn't, and, and the fact that you can't ask yourself that question and you want to go into the fear of, but what happens if I give, don't give them a vaccination? Then they might die, they might get polio, they might do this, they might... Now we're talking about your fears. Yep, and that's not very sincere. That's not love in action now. That's fear in action. Yeah, if we're talking about love in action, then what we would do is we'd focus on the ethical question. The question is, would I like to have done to me what I'm considering doing to somebody else? And the answer to that is often very plain, isn't it? Like every time you ask that question, you pretty much know whether you'd like it or not yourself. And if the answer is I don't know, then there's a different. Then that's different. But most of the time, we do know what we would prefer to do. Most of the time. And this is where again, it's like all the other questions that came up into your mind after that, after I asked you that question, all of that was just justification. You don't want to hear my answer, and that's okay because you'd rather hear the doctor's answer because you're, the doctor's answer. Just had a child and I haven't vaccinated it. Yes, and, and you are afraid. I'm afraid because yes. everyone tells me I should. Exactly, and you're afraid because what if they get polio or something like that? Yeah, How will you feel then? Terrible. Exactly, and that's what you're afraid of. And so you'd rather go and get a jab done, right? Some kind of vaccination done, than you would feel the fear. And is that ethical? Is it ethical to rather go and do something that potentially can hurt another person that's not their choice to do? It's one thing for your adult child to go and get its own vaccination. Quite another for its child 
to have it forced upon it, a vaccination that it can't make the choice of, of its, in its own right to do, and you're only doing it because you're afraid. That's the only reason why you're doing it. And of course, your law of attraction will be, or God's law of attraction will attract to you, people playing on your fear and playing mind games with your fear and saying, yeah, you've I'm got to be afraid. That. Yeah. yeah, and that's all because you're unprepared to feel your fear. And there's the lack of sincerity. You do not want to feel your fear. And you're not sincere about it. I don't it. know how to feel my fear. Ah, but that's not true either. You're feeling it, some of it as I'm speaking, yeah. aren't you? So it's not true what you just told me. That's another insincere lie that you just tell me so, so that you can avoid feeling more of your fear. Yeah. Do you understand? And this is what we keep doing. We go, but, 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 this, but, but, that. And we keep going, we keep going with all these intellectual reasonings. But the reality is right in that moment, a lot of times we are feeling the exact emotion that we think we can't feel. You are feeling your fear. In fact, the very moment that you ask the question about it, which has happened twice now in this discussion, the very moment you ask the question, you were afraid. Why didn't? Why don't you think? I. Why do you think I didn't answer you the first time? Because the motive was insincere. It wasn't a question about is vaccination loving from God's perspective. It was just a question about your fear. You want me to tell you what to do, and then, and then when I tell you what to do, you've got somebody to blame when you didn't <laughs> make the choice yourself. Do you see? I'm trying to see. Yeah. Okay. So. So. Let me, let me say that more truth, more straight with you. You are here. This is your child, daughter or son? Son. Son. That's your child. Who's responsible for your child? Me. That's um, what you're afraid of. So you're afraid to make a choice that, that's out of harmony with what the world thinks you should do. And then the world will say to you, you're being a bad mother when your child gets polio or whatever. That's what you're afraid of. Right? Mm -hmm. And they play on that, right? And so what you do, instead of feeling this fear, instead of you feeling the fear and processing through why you're so afraid, you're, you're afraid of being blamed by the world. You're afraid of what the world's opinion of you as a mother will be. You're afraid of quite a number of things here. So instead of doing that, what you do is you ask me, somebody who has no authority or jurisdiction over your child whatsoever, mm. to arbitrate on a decision that you should have already made. <laughs> do you understand? And the reason why you do that is because then if I tell you do this, you will then have somebody to blame when something goes wrong. That's one of the reasons why you've done this. And you don't even know that yet. <laughs> You'd like to believe it's because you want the right thing for your child, but it's not. It's because you are afraid. And you are unwilling to feel this fear that you have of your child's health. The fear of your child dying and it being your fault. A fear of what that's going to look like from, a, from the world's perspective. That's the fear that's present. And you can feel it. That's the one that you now, that's it. See, that's beautiful. Now you're connecting to it. Yes? And that's all that is needed. Yeah? But it's amazing how much we go through trying to get out of this, get out of that, manoeuvre here, manoeuvre there, manoeuvre here, manoeuvre there, when the real fear is just right there, ready to be felt, but we don't want to feel it. And we don't want to feel it. We ask. And this is what we find in many of the seminars that we have with people, is that many times they're just asking me one fear-based question after another fear-based question after another fear-based question through the point of the seminar. And this is one reason why lately I've taken to doing interviews, because I get a list of questions that are not fear-based or that have been thought out rather than questions that are fear, 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 the motivator. So what I'm trying to do more and more lately in the seminars even is, is confront people's fears and say, look, this is the issue you're having here. You, the issue is a sincerity about feeling this feeling. Are you really sincere about feeling that feeling? Well, at the moment, 
just in that moment, just before when you started to cry, you were sincere about feeling that feeling. That's what it feels like. That's what sincerity of emotion feels like. Before then, you were asking me questions after question after question that weren't sincere because they didn't address the real problem. The real problem was your fear, not the child's immunisation, but your fear of what would happen. That's the real problem. And this is what we often do in our lives. We do not want to address the real problem, so we'll look for other problems all the time, constantly examining, looking for other problems, because we don't want to take responsibility for the problem that's present. And the reality is we'll tell ourselves all things. And if you think about the messages you just told yourself, you told me you, told me you can't feel your fear, but you just did, so that tells me you can. Right? You told me you didn't know how to feel your fear, but you just did, so that tells me you do know how. It's just that we don't want to. You see, every time we tell us these, ourselves these messages, the real thing we should be saying is, I don't want to. <laughs> and the reality is for many of us, we don't want to change. The reality is for many of us, we don't want to feel our negative emotions. The reality is for many of us, we don't want to change our life so much that other people will notice because then they might attack us and we don't want to have, be attacked. And so in the end, we finish up doing a lot of things just because we don't want to have our fear confronted. We don't want to be sincere. Right? We don't want to. And we need to address why we don't want to which is always, usually, f fear. Always. If we have the mic across there. So, babe, it sounds like from what you're saying that if we engage sincerity every moment of the day, mm -hmm. then one change is inevitable. Yes, if change is inevitable. That's yeah. very true, yes. Two there will likely be pain, but over time we will feel better and better. When you say there will likely there be pain, well, let's, let's shorten that to the fact, which is <laughs> there will be pain. There will be pain. Since we haven't been sincere for so long, there's going to be pain now we start to be. Yes, of course, but, but not only for that reason. Error itself causes pain, and as we release error, pain has to be released. So we will feel pain mm. every time. There will be pain. It's guaranteed. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but if we are engaged in sincerity all day, every day, say, yep. change will happen, there will be pain, but very soon we'll feel better overall. Well, because we're feeling the pain, we're releasing it. So every time we engage in another moment of sincerity, we feel a bit more pain, we release the pain, and now the pain's gone. So what's left? Joy. <laughs> Joy, happiness, peace. Relief. Relief. Right? This is what's left. So, so change is inevitable. Pain is inevitable. <laughs> you can't avoid it. And if you're trying to avoid it, you're not going to be, ever be sincere on the path to God. If you try to avoid pain, you're never going to be successful. Because the reality is there are errors within us that have pain associated with them and any time an error is pulled out it's like a big splinter being pulled out in the moment of doing it there's a moment of pain isn't there but if you leave the splinter in what happens it goes infectious and it affects it and sometimes it can you can die from just leaving a splinter in sometimes like there can be septicemia come in and then all sorts of diseases and, and people have died from those kind of very small things. And the reason why is because they're unwilling to go along and cut it open and pull it out. Right? And what we need to do is approach our emotional welfare exactly the same way. Change is inevitable. There will be pain. Pain is inevitable. But thirdly, there will be more joy over time. Yeah, and... and if, you, if, you could, if we could relist this and make it a bit more succinct. If we embrace sincerity every day, change is certain. 
Huh? Pain is certain. <laughs> okay? And? Joy. Joy is, is certain. certain. <laughs> Does that make sense? All right. And, oh, sorry. Go on. Yeah. Well, then I was going to say that the way I can measure my sincerity, if I am sincere, is if I look at my life yep. and if there's no change and I'm not experiencing pain and I'm not increasing in joy, I'm clearly engaged in a process that's not sincere. Totally, and you're clearly engaged in hypocrisy, you're clearly engaged in addiction. And, and the reality is, measure your life. If change and pain is not happening, right, then you are definitely in a case of, in your, in your stages of progression, you're definitely in a state of hypocrisy, you're definitely in a state of addiction. And, and you'll never experience complete joy, ever, while you stay in that state. But when you embrace sincerity, change is certain because you become sincere. You start noticing yourself as you truly are. You can see everything going on. You know exactly who you are. Pain is certain because all of the errors that are in you, the, all of the unloving things that are within you will come out. They're going to have to come out somehow. And they will come out of you. And when that comes out of you, the joy is certain as well. It's definitely going to come along. But also what I feel, um, to, for all of that to happen, there's a primary requirement. And that is, you've got to take action. You can't expect to talk about change and you can't expect to talk about your pain without and expect things to change. You've got to actually feel it. There's got to be an action involved. You can't expect to speak with your friends about the problem or, or the solution to the problem even without personally taking some action on any issue. And that applies to all the issues we've listed. Mary? Um, thanks, Mary. Um, I just wanted to add also, we've just been focused a lot on problems and not facing the problems in ourselves. Yep. Um, but I've been experiencing myself as I've actually been acting on my passions and that also really creates change when I'm acting on my passions also. Oh, I agree, but I can't agree that you're acting on your passions. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> You've been presented with many opportunities that you like the idea of, but instead of acting today, you delay your actions. That's a state of insincerity. You see, if you were truly honouring your desires and passions, uh -huh. you would notice one being presented to you, an opportunity to do one presented to you, and you would instantly embrace it. You wouldn't put it off for any other, for any reason. Even though Am I being, being too... Well, since, since our last meeting, like in the last few weeks, I've been acting, I feel... Um, I know you feel you have been, and I'm saying to you, you're being insincere really? because there are many things that you've been presented with. Okay. Would you like me to be more specific? Yeah, please. What happened in Spain? What happened in Spain? Yeah. Um, I had, I went to investigate yep. um, the possible chance to stay there and live there. Yep. And you, were you offered one? Yes. And does the person want you to be there now? Yes. So why aren't you there? You want to do this? Why aren't you there? Well, I, I came back to... Uh, why? Let's be honest. To see if it was a true desire. Was no. I wanted to test the waters. No. Keep going. Um, one of them was for Jessica. Ah, yes. Yeah. Now we're being truthful. Uh-huh. So wh why did you come back, really? Um, Let's be honest. I was scared of my relationship breaking up. Yes. Yeah. That's why you came back. Yeah. But I'm going back. I'm <laughs> no, you're not going back. When are you going back? Um, in September. Ah, yeah. yes. You're not going back tomorrow, are you? Not tomorrow. No. 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 This is what I'm saying. And why aren't you going back tomorrow? Because what was the reason? Um, I want to spend some more time with Jessica. No, you stated it correctly first. You were afraid of your relationship with Jessica breaking up. Yeah. 
you're afraid that if you embrace a desire right now, mm -hmm. that, a, that your relationship will break up. That's what you're afraid of. And that's why you're not doing it. Yeah. And you're not being sincere about it. You're not being sincere about the reason. You're also not being sincere about the fact that Jess is potentially going on a trip by herself, is she not? Yes. And the reason why you're going back is she'll be gone on a trip in September. Uh -huh. Isn't that not true? That's true. Okay. So uh, you are not addressing this issue with Jess about how afraid you are. Why is she going on a trip by herself if she wants to have a relationship with you? You don't want to feel that. Yeah, it's so one of the things that I ask her. Exactly. Yeah, I, I do ask her. Yeah. Yeah, and she feels like she wants to. So. I understand, yeah. but you're not, you're not expressing how afraid you are of that. This is where the insincerity is, you see. Uh -huh. yeah? And you're also not saying to Jess, well, do you really want to be with me then? Because I, I, the feeling I get is if you want to be off alone doing everything all the time, then you know, I'm starting to question whether you want to be with me, whether we've got the same passions and desires. But you're not willing to have that discussion with her either because... I'm afraid. You're afraid of losing her relationship. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing, you see. It's sort of like, can you see how we can tell ourselves even that we're being sincere while at the very same time being insincere? It's great that you've engaged that with me, Terry, <laughs> because it, it illustrates again this, this process, you see, that we go through. The process we go through is that we, we, we want to tell ourselves that we've got everything down packed, that we're now working through our stuff and all that kind of thing, not realising that the very fear that we have, which in your case is very much related to what the woman feels about you. So some of your core emotional feelings are about what women feel about you. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That's what you're worried about. And, and, and yet that's the very emotion that it took me a little bit of reasoning with you to get to the point of you saying. Up until then, you were, pretty, you were willing to say that you were addressing your desires and passions. And I can't agree. I'm sorry. And you might think I'm just draining out gnats and golfing down camels. But the reality is that if your desire was really present and you didn't have this fear with Jess, you would already be embracing your desire. That's true, isn't it? So, so is it not a true desire until you're actually doing it? Exactly. Right. Yeah, this is a beautiful thing to understand about sincerity. You see, sincerity creates action. When you're truly sincere on any matter, you will change. You will do it now. See, many of, many of us put off things, right? We keep putting them off. Because we're not really sincere, we have fears. Fears cause us to not be sincere. Right? So in this moment, while you believe you're being sincere, there's a big fear. The big fear is what the woman and how she feels about me and whether she's going to want me. That's the big fear. And while that big fear is present, you're not going to engage your desires and passions because that fear is going to dictate a lot of your life. So my suggestion is to look at that fear. That's the one being exposed, so look at that. Now, there's a couple of ways to look at it. One way is to begin addressing with Jess really what's going on inside of yourself when she feels like she wants to be alone and wants to be by herself all the time. What's really happening is you are skipping over many things with Jess. Jess wants to be alone and wants to be by herself a lot of times and doesn't want to engage a relationship with you or any other man because she has fears that she is unwilling to sincerely address. And you're unwilling to address those with her because you're afraid of losing the relationship with her. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so what you finish up doing is one person's avoiding one set of fears, the other person's avoiding the other set of fears, and now we're in this, what I would call, the facade dance. You know, the, 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 the dance of hypocrisy that we have with each other in the relationship. Making out, like, Jess, you're making out you want to go away for, for some reason that you are totally unable to be honest with yourself about, to be frank. Does that make sense? And, and, and you are totally unwilling to address her lack of honesty in why she's actually going away. Uh, and it's a lot to do with her addictions as the reason why she's going away without you. Uh, and you're unwilling to address them in her because you're afraid that if you address them, she won't like you anymore and she'll want to leave you. Mm -hmm. 
which is, which is possible given Jess's tendency to avoid her, her addictions. I agree. Right? That is a possibility. The possibility is that, that you'll say to Jess, look, why is it that this is happening and this is happening? All these things you're uncertain about. And Jess goes, how dare you say these things to me? Because she doesn't want to address her fears, right? She doesn't want to address the reason why she's in her addiction. So she goes, how dare you say all these things? I never want to see you again. Does that make sense? Now, that's one possibility. There is another possibility. There's another one. There's a possibility that Jess will want to deal with her stuff sincerely. That she'll want to stop looking at justifying to herself why she wants to be alone or go away on this particular trip without you. And she'll start looking sincerely at what's going on because you're being honest with her about it. And then you will start maybe addressing this whole issue of how afraid you are of losing the woman's love. Do, do you see? That's the other possibility. But that possibility is not going to happen while you're in facade about both of those things or while Jess is in facade about those things. Does that make sense? It can't happen. It can only happen when we both get out of the facade and into the actual feelings. So, so the way myself and Mary interact all the time is we are constantly addressing with each other feelings that we have with each other as to what we feel is going on, what the real thing that is happening, what, what is the real um, discontent that exists, if any exists. We are also very honest and open about the happiness that exists to the same level, to the same amount. And, and when you do that, every single day is like a growing process. You can't avoid growing every day. Because you're now engaging this process really sincerely. Does that make sense? So, so it's great that you raise the issue because, it, because what it does is it shows how many times we tell ourselves things that are not really true, that skip around the actual issue. Does that make sense? Yeah. And we, we, we see this happening all the time with couples and with individuals, just skipping around this issue, dancing around that issue, trying to avoid this issue. And yet, and yet when you question them, they do know the issue. Like just when I questioned you, eventually when I said no, 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 after a while, you know, you, you eventually... So all those previous ones you gave me, what were they? They were the issue as you would like it to be rather than the issue it really was. You see, and this is why we choose facade. This is why we choose hypocrisy because there's a whole heap of things we'd like to be true. And that's why we want to put on the face, because we want them to be true rather than the real truth. We don't want to feel embarrassed or whatever about the real truth. But when I go, no, it's not that, no, it's not that, no, it's not that, there it is, that one, you can recognise it too. Does that make sense? Yeah, and um, this is where some of, the, some of the times I get confused with uh, personal responsibility. Yep. So I was also had my job, I was just on holiday. Yep. So is it loving if I was in my desire and I was in Spain and I acted on my desire and stayed? Yeah. Then is it unloving just for me to call up my job and say sorry? Who, whose job is it? The job that I was working at. Yeah. Yeah. Whose is it? it the business who I was working but for. But whose is it? It's your job, wasn't it? Yeah. And whose life is it? My life. Yeah. So, so you're allowed to change your life, aren't you? And even now, you're not being truthful with me. Why is that, Mary? I've, got, I've actually gone a bit spaced out. I yeah. Come so it's yeah. come back in. Uh, what's going on? So let, let you, let, let's, let's feel about the actual issue here. Mm -hmm. Do you still have the job? No. <laughs> no. No. So can you see the whole issue you just raised was even a furphy? <laughs> it was a, a self-deception. Why? Why would you raise a self-deception? So you were saying to me that you were coming back for the sake of your job, but the reality is you've lost your job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why would you say that? I think it was coming from the feeling of coming back home to kind of like resolve things in England before going back. Yes, but yeah. the, the real thing you wanted to resolve in England before you went back to Spain and followed your desire mm -hmm. was this girl. 
Yeah. That's the real thing you want to resolve. So let's that, be well, honest. That was, that was the main thing. That's the only thing, really, when you think about it. Her. Mm -hmm. Like, you want her to be in your life and, uh, and you'd love to embrace these things together. Mm -hmm. Isn't that not true? Yeah. Yeah. But Jess has problems with that, doesn't she? A little, yeah. Not just a little. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, be honest, right? She has problems with that. So, so, you know, unless you resolve these issues together in a loving manner, then um, it's going to be quite difficult either way. And this is, the, this is the issue you face, is that in this previous question you asked about your job, you were, you were trying to distract yourself, not me, because I already know what the problem is. <laughs> You're trying to distract you away again from the real issue. Do you see? You want to give yourself another reason or two as to why you didn't follow your desire. But the first reason was good enough, in my opinion, to examine, because that is the one that was really present. Uh -huh. and, and you don't need to find other reasons, you just need to focus on that reason as to why you come back and sacrificed your desire to do so. And you need to examine what's really going on between yourself and Jess. Or, and, and to be frank with you, you have deep feelings inside of yourself that Jess's heart is not committed with you. Is that not true? That's true. Now, Jess's heart is not committed with you. Is that not true? Uh, and, and so this is the problem. If you're in a relationship with somebody whose heart is not committed with you, then of course there's going to be a problem now. now. Now, I'm not saying Jess doesn't want to love you because there is a feeling I have that she does. But there is obviously reasons why she's not fully embracing her heart in the relationship. And you are so frightened of that that you're willing to sacrifice six good weeks in Spain uh, instead of inviting her out to there with you um, in order to address that particular issue. And I understand why, you know, I can see why. But, but what I'm suggesting to you is you need to be sincere about that. So you need to be sincere about the reasons why you're doing that. Because if, if you're sincere, you'll find what's going on. right? But if you're not sincere, you won't find what's going on. You, you'll skirt around the issue, ask questions. You'll be asking other people, what should I do? <laughs> what should I do? What do you think I should do? Uh, when in your heart there's already a feeling that, that you know something's up with Jess, you know that her heart's not involved in your relationship as much as yours is, and you can feel that. Right? And you're unwilling to address it because you're afraid of scaring her away from you even more and losing the relationship for good. Right? And this is the main reason why you av av avoid the issue. So, so the beauty of sincerity in this case is that you'd go, wow, yeah, that's exactly what I feel, actually. And you have some grief about that, so you'd probably have a cry about it. And then you'd also want to erase the issue with Jess. And the beauty of doing that is that Jess might then have to be forced into, through the interaction, she will have to force into, why am I not opening my heart to this man who I am acting like I want to have a relationship with but not really having one with? Uh, why am I doing that? What's happened in my past that's causing me to be blocked? to having this relationship in my heart, you know? And it, then it allows you to address that issue together without anger and without, you know, resentment, but to actually focus on the real issue. When that doesn't happen, of course, we go into our facade and then, then Jess will justify her behaviour because, oh, she's got a child and she's got to do this with the, you know, with the ex and whatever, and, and then you'll go, well, I feel, you know, and you'll get into your facade as well about what you feel, and that doesn't address the issue. And this is where I feel it's very powerful if you can do this. If you can do this sincerity, with sincerity, you can rapidly get to it. What I find's happened, and it's taken us some time, hasn't it, Dalen, to actually each of us go, be sincere 100% of the time with each other and, and stick to the problem, the actual problem, not the problem that we want to be there instead of the actual problem. You see, 
the beauty of the actual problem is that's where all the grief is. And so therefore, if we resolve it, that's where also all of our happiness will finish up being. Mm -hmm. But if we choose a, a different problem, then that's not where our grief is. And therefore, when it's resolved, it's also not going to make us happy. <laughs> Can you see? It's almost like we spend all of our time focusing on issues that are neither where the pain is nor where the potential joy can be. And remember, we listed this. If the pain is certain, right? And, it, and, it, and in fact, once the pain is released, joy is certain. But, but if we're focusing on a problem in, in a, with a lack of sincerity, if we're focusing on a problem where there is no pain, we also are certain in the future to not have any joy in resolving that problem. And I see people doing this all the time, um, even with their relationships with uh, each other, but also their work environment and everything, where they focus on solving a problem, solving this particular problem, when that particular problem ends up with nobody being happier. And this particular problem, whatever you, you know, the real one, ends up, if you resolve it, ends up with everyone being happier. And I know where I'd rather spend my time and the problems that end up with everyone happier. Yeah. And that's where I feel if you can focus that yourselves on the same issue, I think you'll find a huge amount of benefit with that. Yeah. And as advice in this situation, I know there is, instead of me trying to change Jessica's mind or it's just to feel how that feels for me. Um, no, like if, if you feel that Jessica is not doing the right thing and not being honest with herself, then it's right for you to say, Jessica, you're not being honest with yourself. I feel there is something more here that you're not facing. There's some addiction going on here that you're not facing. And, and I feel I'd like to face it and I'd like to work my way through it and be honest about that. So I'm not saying to just sit there quietly no, feeling your own there. emotions. Oh, okay. yeah. right? I'm saying that you need to feel your own emotions, but there's still the problem. And the problem does need to be resolved. And the only way it's going to be resolved is by the two of you finding the solution, which exists by both of you feeling different emotions. That's the only way it's going to be resolved. Other than that, if you don't resolve it, you can't come together. You can't be closer than you currently are. And I know you desperately want to be, closer than you currently are but that's partly some of the addiction that's involved for you and Jess desperately wants to have some level of control in a relationship and some level of like like you know maintaining a distance so that she can feel safe you know and not get her heart too involved and that's her issue that she needs to allow herself to work her way through and if you both embrace this issue in truth and in harmony with sincerity there's a good chance that both of you will address those problems but if, if, if one of you acts out of harmony with sincerity, or the other does, or both of you do, there's no chance of ever resolving that problem. And if you think about it, this problem has been present for a long time in your relationship for different reasons. Now, some of the reasons why you can't open your heart is because of some things that have happened in the past with the man that you're unwilling to tell him about. Does that make sense? So... This is where, again, if we're sincere and open, uh, we can work our way through all of that pain. And one of the reasons why we don't want to share what's happened in the past is because you want to avoid the pain of it, of how it felt. Does that make sense? And, and constantly people in relationships are trying to avoid this pain, trying to avoid that pain, and so forth. We're really dancing around, like I said, in the facade, dancing around the pain, trying to avoid the pain. And yet where the pain is, is also eventually where all of our joy can be. So if, if our relationship is causing us pain, if we focus on the relationship and focus on what is causing the pain in the relationship, now we have the potential of creating joy in that area. But if we just let the pain fester like a sore on our arm that's you know festering and growing and we let it fester and fester and we don't fix it sooner or later it's going to infect the whole thing our whole relationship will probably die from that one relationship from that one problem yeah Jess you wanted to ask a few things or you want me to bring you there? 
Um, I'm not sure if it's relevant, actually, but um, what I was going to say then was um, about forgiveness. And um, whenever you have experienced pain, I feel like, truthfully, there isn't really a need for forgiveness because once you actually own your, your um, the law of attraction that brought you an event that was painful, um, and once you're really truthful with yourself, there isn't this need for forgiveness, which is kind of a judgment, isn't it? Once you feel all of the causal emotion of what created the pain, which might be related to, in your case, it's very much related to your childhood, related to, you know, dad and issues surrounding your dad and so forth. There's a lot of causal emotional pain in there. And, and once you feel that emotion, then the pain automatically has gone. And when the pain's gone, forgiveness is automatic. You're right, yeah, forgiveness is automatic. But only once that causal pain is gone. So, so the reality is, Perry could do something to injure your relationship right now. You could go through forgiveness of him, right, by feeling the pain he caused you, right? But in the end, you're not going to forgive him completely until the causal pain, which is related to your father, is also addressed. Right? then you have forgiven completely. Until then, you're basically blaming every man for your dad's actions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so any man that comes along into your life is automatically going to feel blamed before he begins the relationship while this causal emotion exists. And this causal emotion is the cause, the primary cause, in fact, of your own pain. And therefore, the primary limiter of your own joy. So and this is where I feel like people in the Western culture in particular, but in pretty much all cultures on the earth, pain is something that everyone wants to avoid. Right? But the problem is, pain is the only way, it's the things that cause us pain that also are the things that will potentially give us joy if we resolve the pain. So we have no hope of ever being happy while we're avoiding our pain. Also, we are, our soul is not able to select between painful and pleasurable experiences. If we are going to be open, we're going to have to experience every painful and pleasurable experience. That's what it means to be open. Eventually, as we release all the pain within us, none of the experiences will be painful. But it requires complete emotional openness to do this. What many of us are still trying to do is to select. We try to say, is this, is this a painful? Yes, I don't want to feel it then. Is this pleasurable? Yes, well, I'll feel that. But the problem is, while you're shutting down your pain, you're never going to feel the pleasure. So it's impossible to feel complete pleasure while you're also shutting down your pain. So it, it's a very necessary thing to understand that pain is certain and to actually you know, be content with that through this process. I know I've asked you this lots, but I really struggle with um, actually feeling what the causal is. And I get, I've done some work understanding like what the emotions are, but actually getting a direct feeling of like, oh, I remember that happening. Um, a lot of times you don't even need to worry about that. Let's say Perry does something, triggers an emotion in you. Like, for example, Perry does something and you feel you are no longer got control of the relationship let's say. So what do you feel? You feel out of control. You feel you no longer got control. Initially you'll have anger, so you feel some of the anger, and then you have fear, and you feel the fear, and then you'll have a cry about the fact that you've no longer got control. Eventually, if you let yourself get there, you'll cry about it. During that cry about it, you will release some of this causal emotion. Eventually, as you go through that process each time he does something that you feel you know, you're out of control with, you'll eventually get to what really caused you to feel out of control. You will eventually get there. You might not get there the first time you do it, but if you just let the emotion go without trying. So let yourself feel the pain without trying to find what caused it. Whenever we try to find what causes it, right, whenever we try to find that pain and what causes it, we are now out of sincerity with the process. Because the process is just feel it and you'll find what caused it. And if you're going, oh, but what's this about? Oh, I think it's, oh, I don't know if it's about my dad. I don't know if it's about my mom. What is it? Oh, I don't know if I... 
now you're already out of the process, the sincere process that a child would have, which is just have a big cry because he hurts or she hurts. That's what you need to have. Okay. Yeah. Um, I also had another question. Sure. It's changing the subject. <laughs> is the subject about this subject or not? Kind of not. No. Shall I leave it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so what I'd like to do, though, is finish off now, actually, and I'd like to encourage each of you to, to focus on becoming a lot more sincere with yourselves about what's really inside of you and also a lot more sincere with everyone around you about what you feel. And take action in your life. Take action. Don't put off your actions. You get presented with opportunities constantly by God every single day. And many times in, the moment, in those moments, what we do is we get presented with the opportunity and then we run away from the opportunity. And I don't know about you, but if, if somebody came along and presented you one opportunity and you didn't take it and they present you with another opportunity, you didn't take it and present you another one and you don't take that, what eventually happens is the opportunities will start becoming less and less, won't they, in our lives? Until such a point in time that we feel like our lives are just stagnant and mundane and then we might ch make some changes. My suggestion is every opportunity that comes along to change and deal with something in sincerity, do it now. Do it right away. If you do it right away, you have the possibility of joy soon after. If you don't do it right away, then there will be no joy soon after. Joy is not going to be possible without taking action and acting in sincerity. Yeah. So I just wanted to uh, discuss that with you today. I hope that's been okay. And uh, thanks, baby. <laughs> Mary was happy about that. <laughs> Mary was happy about that conversation. Yeah. Um, but uh, my, myself and Mary are, um, uh, well, not tomorrow, the next day we're flying across to the USA and, um, and we're going to be meeting up with a group of people there in Philadelphia, um, which is near, near U New York. And, um, and then we go down to Barbados to visit some friends that I've got there for, for a short period of time before we go to Brazil. And we'll be in Brazil for three weeks, so in three cities there. So um, we're going to be doing a bit of travelling before we go home. But it's been good that we've had this brief opportunity to catch up with you, um, which we which we like to thank Michael, although he's not here, um, for helping us create because he organised the venue and and you know all of the things to do with the venue as well so we'd like to thank him for that and we don't have a donation box with us i don't think um we have a backpack yeah. we have a donations backpack if you'd like to just contribute to the hall hire and things like that that's fine there's a backpack up the back in black um on the desk there just if you've got any donations you want to give us just put them in there and uh, we'll, we're going to pay out of those donations, Michael, for the venue hire and a few other things like that. Oh, yeah, up the back. Yeah. Yeah. Do you mind having a photo after, you've, after we finish? And one other thing I'd like to, persons I'd like to thank too, is this trip of ours, Mary and myself, uh, have been paid for by just a couple of people in Australia. And so you actually have to thank a couple of people in Australia for donating uh, all of our money to travel. And so we'd just like to thank them for... They, they know who they are. We'd just like to thank them for the opportunity to see you guys. And, uh, and if you could just think about that as well, that there's somebody over the other side of the world who has loved you enough to want to share the truth with you in this way so much that they've been willing. They gave us $15,000 because uh, it's a round-the-world trip for two people um, to visit all of these different locations um, without any personal benefit of their own. That's a very loving act, isn't it? Like, so we'd just like to thank them for that. Okay, thanks for your time tonight and <laughs> hope to catch up with you soon again. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you.